Good evening. It's fine, you me. Okay. Uh, yes, I can hear you. I would like us to observe our safety precautions during this session. Uh, should in case you want to speak, you should unmute your mic and raise up your hand should in case you want to speak also. And should in case you have anything to say, we should also learn to use the chat box for questions and comments. Ensure you still can hear the fire alarm should in case you are using a headset. Be at alert and aware of your environment during this session and always remember to stay safe because safety is actually a priority. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, David, for that uh, safety moment. All right, so that's done. Let's have uh, the introduction of uh, SP executives and senior members um, on the call. All right, so um, I want to call on the, uh, the team lead to take on that for us, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. We can all thank right. you very much. All right, please go ahead. Hi, Joel, please confirm you can hear me. I can hear you, yes. I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, great. So um, I'm just... I'm just going to um, introduce um, the drivers of this, um, our great SPE section one of You know, these are people that have been driving the affairs, you know, of the section, the amazing things you hear the section do, the great programs, you know, the projects, you know, the, 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 the charity outreaches and, and whatnot. So I'm just going to look through the um, participant list and uh, I will identify who and who we have here. So on the call, I can see, um, the, the chairperson of the Young Professionals, the person of Justice Vidigo, uh, you're very recognized. Uh, I can also see um, Mrs. Dokas uh, Kuro. Dokas is the assistant secretary of this great section. Uh, all the way from uh, legal section, I can see Ms. Tura Yusuf. Ms. Tura, you're welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, yeah, I think that's about all I can see on the call. So as as we get more executive members, section directors, and senior members, I would um in between the um training uh, introduce them. Thank you very much. For the sake of time, I would bet that we just continue. Thank you very much. Back to you, Joe. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that introduction. All right, so let's get straight into the opening remark by the YP chair. Um. So why be The floor is yours, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so I good afternoon all. Uh please confirm you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, good afternoon all and all. Welcome to uh this technical training. I can see a chat on the chat box for the lighter notes. Uh let's also I also recognize that Joshua Ate, uh the industry collaboration. Committee lead for the YP and uh, uh, the industry collaboration committee help set this up. I'm just replying to Dr. Smith. And also, Mr. Ayutub is also the your professional chair for Africa. Yeah, so that's a big uh, one. Thank you for joining me. Okay, so uh, it's very important as the times are evolving that we have uh, topics like this or trainings like this uh, because we are technical sessions as. Uh, engineers and energy personnel, we are technical persons, and it's also good we know how to distinguish ourselves. So that's what it was about the this topic that we are having now, which is a simulation program with mobile tech. Yeah, so I'll enjoy all of us to actually pay attention and also try to make sure you don't you you, you don't lose you don't you don't come and spend your time without gaining the the rest of that knowledge you're supposed to get. So this, uh, like it says, an introduction 
uh, but definitely we cannot be much more. So I'm welcoming all, I'm welcoming all of us to the meeting that is training. Make sure you gain as much as you can gain from the section. And uh, definitely we are going to be in for the best. So just expect the best. Thank you. And uh, happy, happy and dedicated training. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, YP Chair. Hello, please come if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Go ahead. Great. All right. Thank you so much, YP Chair, for that uh, opening remark. All right. So uh, with that uh, done, let's go straight to the next um, um, section, which is to introduce the instructor. All right. So without further ado, I'll just read through what we have on the slide. So professionally, uh, Dr. Matthew uh, is a process modeling engineer. In 2005, he co-founded Mobatech, which is based in Netherlands. Um, he's currently the managing director, and together with his team, they resolve real-world challenges for companies. Knowledge buildup, optimization, design, control, learning and training, safety, in which process models play a significant role to get to the solution. Over the years, he has built a lot of dynamic process models for many different purposes, such as research, operator training simulators, teaching, control, PLC testing, real-time simulating, optimization, engineering. He has spent many, many hours debugging these models and run into all Im unimaginable errors. As a result, he can solve any problem um, related to dynamic process models quickly and efficiently. Finally, um, besides process modeling, he likes to spend time with his family. He has four kids, play strategic board games, and he loves to play piano, trumpet, or trombone. Ladies and gentlemen, our instructor, Dr. Matthew, that's the introduction. All right, so without further ado, uh, we'll call on our instructor, Dr. Matthew to take the floor now. Welcome, sir. Yes, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me as well. Yes, loud and clear. Okay, that's great. Thanks for the nice <laughs> introduction. Uh, should, should I sh stop uh, share my video or is it? Yes, please. Can you, or also my face, I mean, or is it not visible? I don't know. It's fine, sir, go ahead, go ahead, sir. All right, I will share my screen anyhow then. There I go. Can you see it? Because I don't know. Yes. <laughs> I'm not very familiar with uh, with Zoom. Oh, ah, there I am in the corner. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Nice uh, that you have invited me to this uh, to this session. I will put this one over here so I can see myself. Good. So uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about on uh, equation-based modeling. Uh, let me see. One second. Uh, it's being uploaded. Okay. I'm going to do it like this. Yeah. Good. Uh, yeah. At first, I, I was contacted by uh, Anifiok, if I pronounce it correctly. And he asked me to do a, a webinar. Uh, I thought about one <laughs> one hour or one hour and fifteen minutes, but it turned out to be quite a bit more. So uh, I've uh, took, taken the liberty to also invite my colleague, uh, Mr. Vladimir Ovradovich, and he will dive in a little bit deeper into the equation-based uh, modeling part. And I will start off with an introduction uh, on our company. So Mobatech. It stands for model-based technology, so abbreviated MOBA-TECH. And we are uh, situated in the Netherlands, as uh, was already announced. So I have a background in uh, chemical engineering. I did my studies in Eindhoven University of Technology. And after that, I also did uh, a promotion uh, doctoral research, which focused on equation-based modeling. So how to get from a process to a model of that process. And as a result of that uh, doctoral study, I, I generated the first uh, version of a program 
which has now extended to our uh, software to Mobatec modeler. And what I could do is I could uh, generate the equations that were needed to be solved uh, for process modeling, but I didn't solve them because I didn't write my own solver. And then uh, at some point I met uh, Dr. Jan Lawrence and he wrote his own equation-based solver. But wh what he did is, uh, well, uh, so, <laughs> So he, he, he typed out all the equations and then he could solve them. But typing out the equations, that's a lot of work. And if I generate the equations and Jan solves the equations, that's actually, well, we thought uh, one and one is three and we should start our own business. So that's what we did almost 20 years ago now. So we started with just two people, uh, which was quite fun, but also challenging because if you have a small company with Two people, well, your income goes a bit a little like this, if you see my my finger. Uh, so I decided to also become the coordinator of a post-master program, which is called process and product design here in Eindhoven. And that's a special study where uh, students who have already finished their master, typically in chemical engineering, they want to learn more how to apply the theory they have learned in practice. So that's a specialized program where all the lecturers, they come from industry and they teach the students how to really apply their knowledge in industry. It's a very nice program. I still teach there, but I stopped being the coordinator as my company started growing in 2012. But I still go back every year to teach about uh, equation-based modeling there. But for me, it was also very nice to be there as an instructor because, uh, well, I could uh, meet with a lot of young students and some of them were very eager in modeling. So uh, some of those uh, I hired to grow my company. One of those is Vladimir, by the way, who is also in the chat. And he will tell you uh, how he likes modeling at Mobatec at a later point. So now we're uh, continuously growing. We are now with more than 10 people in our company solving all kinds of industrial problems. So what we do, uh, let's see here. Oh yeah, we have uh, developed our software tool, which is called Mobile Tech Modeler. And I will show you all about it uh, in, during this session. And with that, you can uh, make uh, all kinds of equation-based process models. This is well specifically going to the and dynamic modeling is also taking into the time uh, scale effects. And what we do is we license our software uh, but we also build models ourselves. So we have actually a, a pre-taste, so to say. So we either do uh, let our clients, we model for them, or we model with them, or uh, we let them model themselves. Right? So uh, all the ranges are there. Sometimes we have companies who just want to have a tool to do modeling. Then we offer some uh, consulting. And sometimes companies say, well, we don't have time or we don't have the knowledge. Please make the model for us such that we can use the model. So all these things are available. And one of the uses, which I'm going to show you a little bit about, uh, because that's nice to show, uh, is operator training simulators. It's a very nice uh, aspect of uh, modeling in our environment. So this is uh, some of the, the customers we are serving. Uh, I would guess some of you, some of them you also know in, in Nigeria, right? I guess Shell is known. Uh, Maybe DSM or Sabic, I don't know. You'll have to <laughs> fill me in there. But we have quite some uh, uh, companies we're serving now. At, at the moment, I think we are running something like 20 or 25 projects in parallel with the 10 people, uh, with 11 people of our company. So modeling can be used for quite some uh, goals. In the beginning, especially when we were smaller, we typically did research projects. So we, we looked at one certain piece of equipment and dived into that and made a really accurate process model. And at later points, we also took on a bigger projects for operator training simulators. And then you actually model an entire plant uh, and, and predict the behavior. So there is uh, quite some uh, diff uh, different types of modelings uh, you can use. Well, if you want to have quick results, you can do the so-called low fidelity modelling, which is not so accurate, but it runs very fast and gets you to some answers relatively quickly. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have these high fidelity process models, 
also computational fluid dynamics. They are really, really accurate, but it typically also takes a very, very long time to calculate. And what we are typically interested in is the so-called right fidelity process model. So they calculate quickly, but still they have quite a high fidelity, so a high physical resolution, so to say. And you can solve all kinds of problems with these kinds of models. Eh? So you can do uh, bottlenecking, of optimization, maximizing production, evaluation. You can do training, etc. But uh, well, at one point you need to have the model, so you need to uh, get there. Eh? So how to get there? So you have a certain process. This is a process, but how do you get from this process to a model? of the process. And that's what modeling is all about. And that's what we do at Mobatech. So how do you translate a process to a model of the process? And how do you translate that model into a piece of computer code that the computer understands such that you can get the equations uh, and the results that you are looking for? So what, what we do is so-called first principle modeling. So, so no, uh, no black boxes, no, no data-driven uh, modeling, etc. We really uh, take the, the laws of physics and we try to apply that uh, to get to the results that we're looking for. And so it's also pressure-driven and not mass flow-driven models. So we can have models for incompressible and compressible fluids. And when there is, for example, a pressure difference, then there will be a flow. If there's a temperature difference, there will be a, a heat flowing, etc. We uh, support uh, vapor liquid equilibriums, uh, geometry, physical topology definition, quite some thermodynamical physical property databases, but we'll zoom into that a little bit uh, later. Okay, so what we have here, th this is an example of, uh, of a model of Mobatech. She's called Xenia, of course, and she's presenting another model, uh, which is uh, a screenshot of our modeling software, which is called Mobatech Modeler. Oh, in the meantime, I see something going on in the chat. Should I have a look? Ah, all right. Okay. No, there's no certificate for this. <laughs> That's uh, This is just a webinar. <laughs> Good. So this is a, an example of a process model. So what we are doing is mainly uh, dynamic process modeling as opposed to steady state modeling. Most of you people probably know steady state modeling and are used to working with HISIS or Aspen or Honeywell, Unisim, uh, Hamcat, all these kind of tools, Pro2, Simulator, etc. Uh, but we are really interested in the dynamics. So this is an example of a model we did actually more than 10 years ago already. But this was the client, they have a factory and it was divided in two main parts. And this part uh, generated a lot of heat. And to get rid of the heat, they were these three very large heat exchangers and they exchanged heat with the canal, which was there. So they dumped the heat in the canal. And then there was another part of a process. And uh, it was actually, this was, uh, if I recall correctly, 24 megawatts, so quite something. And there was another part of the process that required 24 megawatts of heat and they generated it. So the, uh, well. That's a bit strange, of course. So after, I don't know, 40, 50 years, there was a smart engineer who said, maybe we should heat combine this. Uh, but the, the, the difficulty was that these two parts of the factory were 900 meters uh, distantiated from each other. So they were not close by, they were very far away. So the only way to do that was to build a very large pipeline that would transport the heat from this section to this section, apply it here and then return it to this section. But that's dynamically very challenging. So they were uh, interested in first having a process model in which they could do all kinds of scenarios and test it very well and also test their control algorithms they made because if something goes wrong here or here, then the processes should be able to separate again and run separately. So we built a, a nice uh, process model and they could test all the control schemes that they were uh, interested in. And it was a very successful uh, project uh, in the end. And this is another example of another client of ours. This was uh, a factory, uh, actually a company that had uh, three factories on the same site. Eh? So this was plant one, plant two, plant three. And through the entire factory was a huge uh, steam network. 
So this was a high pressure steam network, a 65 bar G steam header. And there was also a 20 bar uh, G steam header and 12 bar header. And in the plants, there were also some steam headers, so uh, lots of steam. And what they did, they bought their steam from an external company, uh, which was two kilometers down the road. And uh, well, if you know chemical factories, these are these huge pipelines with these use in between it. It's uh, steam that comes from a far place. The advantage of that is, if you buy your steam, is that you have a constant back pressure. And if something goes wrong, either at the steam producer or at your plant, the, because it's such a huge capacity, it, it takes quite a while before you feel the pressure drop or pressure rise. So it's a very big capacity. But the downside of having this uh, buying your steam at an external company is that it's, it's very expensive. So at one point in time, this uh, company decided to build their own steam boilers on site, which in the long run would for sure be cheaper. But uh, the downside here is that the dynamics would change drastically because now you don't have two kilometers of a huge pipeline, but only 200 meters of a smaller pipeline. So the dynamics are drastically impacted. So what they wanted to do is um, make first a, a, a dynamic process model covering all their safeguarding and the control schemes, which we all implemented into a model, and test many scenarios. So what would happen if something went wrong here or here, or maybe something changes in this plant or in this plant or in this plant? So many, many scenarios. And there was one scenario where the 20 bar header was venting off steam to the environment. So it was receiving too much steam, and while the 12 bar header it was dropping in pressure, which was a strange situation, of course. But it was also very temporary. So there was a temporary pressure drop, and then it came back again. Oh, but the downside was that the pressure drop was so far that part of the, uh, the plant, too, was tripping. So it was uh, shutting down. And that would cost, of course, a lot of money. And... Uh, well, we had to find out what's wrong. Eh? Is there something wrong with the control algorithm? Uh, what, what, what is going wrong in this situation? And after quite some uh, puzzling, we found out that this valve was physically dimensioned too small. So it couldn't handle the flow from this header to this header. And that's why things were uh, going wrong. So they were very, very happy with the findings of this simulation because we did a lot of simulation runs. And when they started, building their new boilers uh, during the turnaround. They also implemented a new valve such that they would never encounter this situation. And they saved uh, enormous amounts of money by this uh, small operation and also by doing this, uh, this test. And this shows you the value of dynamic simulation because you would have never found this issue with steady state simulation because both scenarios, the end goal was, was, was good, was good, but it was the transition that made the dip and that would explain this. So this was a very useful uh, exercise and the companies were very happy <laughs> with uh, the small model that we made. And another practical application of modeling, eh? so I'm talking about applications of process modeling, not about the modeling itself. Another uh, very practical application is operator training because in factories there work operators that operate uh, the plant. And what's the case that many, many of the plants, especially in the Netherlands, they are built 50 or 60 years ago. So, and at that time, there was not a, a lot, much uh, automation. So there was a low degree of automation and the operators that worked there, they knew how to operate their plant. They knew what to do when something went wrong, they go there, they, they adjust the valve, etc. They do some settings. Uh, so they said they had a lot of hands-on experience, these operators. But then uh, computers introduced themselves and their uh, controllers were invented and added on the, on, on the factories. And on top of the controllers, there were controllers controlling the controllers. Huh? So that's uh, advanced process control, they call it, or model predictive control. The positive thing about that is that some plants, they run very steady for a long time. Some plants run steadily for, I don't know, uh, maybe two or three years. So that's a positive thing eh? for, from an economic side. But also the negative thing is that these plants run steady for 
two years. And that means that new operators, they have no clue what to do. They always look at a steady process, but when things go wrong, what should they do? Uh, and they don't know anymore because they don't know how the plan to runs because a computer does that for them. So it's, it's a bit of the same business case as a flight simulator because nowadays a computer uh, takes off with the plane, a computer flies the plane and the computer does the landing, eh? unless it goes wrong. Because if it goes wrong, then the pilot takes over and he steers the plane to the ground. And in that case, you hope that your pilot, of course, if you're in the plane, uh, did a good training on the simulator before he does something like this, because it hardly ever happens. And that's the same business case for uh, operator training simulators. One of the business cases, by the way. So, so to train your operators uh, in upset situations or situations that do not occur very often. And because the, the experienced operators, they will soon retire and they will uh, go away from the companies and then the new operators obviously have to take over. So how does it look like? Eh? So you have your processing plants and you have this control room. And in the control room, you have is a distributed control system. So they, these are these screens. From that, the operators are operating uh, the, the factory. And this is communicating with the control layer and with the safeguarding layer. And this is communicating with the input output of the factory. And with this, you are controlling your factory. So what are we doing? Uh, what we are doing is we are making a so-called digital twin, so an operator training simulator. And what we do is we try to keep this part identical. So it's that the look and feel for these guys in the simulator room is exactly the same as in the real factory. And so they, they have the same uh, man-machine interface uh, look and feel, and they also have the same control layer. But you're now not operating a real plant but you are operating a dynamic process simulator. And this is our expertise. Mobatech, what, what do we do good? Is we make uh, simulators, so uh, models of entire processing plants. But nowadays uh, we also make, uh, we can emulate the control layers and also the safeguarding, especially for older plants, by the way, because then the safeguarding, et cetera, is typically hardwired and you have to rebuild it when you make a simulator. And what we nowadays also can do is we can mimic the entire, also the, the control system. Because uh, if you want to work with a copy of a control system, you, the company typically also have to buy a license for a new control system. And that can be very, very, very expensive. And in some cases, it works better if we just uh, redraw the drawings and then the, the end solution is uh, cheaper and it still looks the same as we have here. Okay, so this is how an operator training simulator works. And such a simulator uh, consists of a certain uh, amount of elements. So the heart of the simulator is the dynamic process model. And this is a screenshot of our modeling software. So what we do is we make it look like the piping and instrumentation diagrams, so the P and IDs of the plant. So we kind of redraw them, but we make them dynamic. So on this uh, screen, you can just access all kinds of valves. You can start and stop a pump. You can close, open a valve. You can uh, look at filters, etc., heat exchangers, uh, temperature measurements, pressure measurements. Everything is possible on this. And then we connect this to the control layer and to the safeguarding. And with this, uh, we connect it also to the distributed control system. So what you see here, for example, this is the, the simulated control room in which they have uh, eight screens. And in the real control room, there are also eight screens. And in the real control room, they use Emerson Delta V as a control system. And this is also Emerson Delta V. So the look and feel for these guys is exactly the same as it would be uh, in, uh, in the real control room. Uh, we can connect our software, by the way, to Emerson, to Yokogawa, to Honeywell, to ABB, to Schneider Electric, to Siemens, and uh, you name it. So for us, it makes no difference what the real control system is. We can make a model and then connect the two and make them uh, communicate with each other. 
What you also have a lot in uh, in factories are these hardboard panels with with push buttons. So it's for em emergency overrides or, or maintenance overrides. Uh, so if you press the button, then something happens in the real plant. But instead of making a new hardboard panel, we typically typically take a picture and then we put it on a touch screen. So if you then push the button uh, on the touch screen, then you see the button going up and down and the lights are also flashing. That makes it quite realistic and also a bit cheaper to implement. So the only difference between a real plant and the simulated plant is that we also now have a instructor panel. And this instructor, he can load all kinds of uh, scenarios that he wants to train. Eh? You want to train a startup, maybe a shutdown or a, a situation that doesn't occur very often. Uh, or, or just uh, train a, a new coming uh, uh, operator or an experienced operator. Oh, recording in progress. <laughs> okay. <laughs> never, never mind. Good. Um, um, so... So there's one thing uh, now that's missing if you have uh, a training simulator, because a real plant is operated not only in the control room, but also in the field. Eh? So in, in the factory itself, people physically need to go there. Maybe they need to open a valve or close a valve or start or stop a pump, and they physically need to walk over there. But that's an element you're missing because we now have not a real plant, but we have a simulation of a plant, which is a computer model. So the solution to that typically is that the trainer just pretends to be the field operator. So uh, when these guys uh, who are training here, they ask, uh, please start pump uh, 713. Then this guy waits a little bit and then he clicks on the pump and starts the pump. But yeah, it's obviously not completely real. And above all, this trainer, he can start a pump, which is physically uh, 600 meters away, but he can start it in two seconds later, which is obviously not uh, realistic. Another solution that we see a lot nowadays are these 3D environments. So you can put on these 3D glasses, and then you are in another world, in a virtual reality world, and you can walk through it. You can walk up to pumps and work up to valves, and then uh, virtually open a valve or virtually start a pump. So we can link our software to these kinds of environments. We can even do that with pictures. So you can browse to pictures. And then uh, if you zoom in, you can click on the open button. And then the next picture you see is this. The, the downside of these things is uh, if a training takes a bit longer and you have this virtual hat on, uh, that's, it's going to make you a little bit nauseous. <laughs> and, uh, and it's a bit strange to be in a virtual world for a longer period of time. So then we had a very nice uh, idea, which is unique in the world still, by the way. So we, we thought, why not use the real plant, if it's a real plant, of course, if it's there, for the training. But the real plant is running steadily, as I said. So you, have, you cannot touch it, but you can use the locations that are there. So how do we do? We have a, a very nice movie for that. So, so you can take note of this. You should for sure have a look. It's only two minutes movie called Mobatech NL slash technology, which is uh, it's really nice. So what we do is near, uh, I don't know if you can see me in my uh, little screen, but near, near the valve you want to operate or the pump, you hang these tags. These are NFC tags and you scan them with your phone. And these tags are special. They are ATAX approved. So that means they are explosion safe. And also this phone is explosion safe. So if you scan the tag, which is very near the unit you want to operate, you get a picture. So what you see here, for example, is this guy went up to a pump switch. And then he scanned the tag. And then he gets a picture of the pump switch. And on the picture, he can operate. Maybe he can start the pump. And in reality, it stays uh, uh, as it is in reality, but this will operate the pump in the simulator. And we can do the same for valves. So near the valve, you can hang this tag. And if you scan the tag, you get a picture of the tag and you can operate it. You can even do it with a slider so you can open it very slowly or quickly, whatever you want. And we can make tags near uh, things that are uh, only in the field. Then maybe you have a local pressure transmitter 
then you can scan the tag and see what the pressure would be in the situation that you're training currently. So the nice thing about this is that you have to walk the real distances. You have to wear your safety helmet and your safety glasses and everything. Uh, and you have to you have the disturbance or noises and you have to operate the real correct equipment because if you open the wrong valve or start a wrong pump, something will go wrong in the simulator. You have to communicate with the guy in the control room, in this case, the simulated control room. So this makes a training very, very, very realistic. And it's appreciated in industry. And it's actually also a cheaper solution than making a virtual environment. And you're using the real environment. So that's a really good training. So, and on top of that, uh, by the way, we added something else uh, because if you're there and you're training, you can just as well maybe answer some questions, right? So maybe if you're walking up to a pump, uh, then you get up some questions, mark all the signs of pump cavitation, for example. Or maybe if you're uh, doing something else, you want to play an instructional video of how this piece of equipment is operating. Or maybe you, you can, uh, well, uh, do some tasks there. Eh? So that's very nice. So we, we so we added on top of this something we call mobile quest, and then you can also further extend on your knowledge. So it's really useful for operators who want to train and who want to learn more. Okay, so no more pen and paper needed. Yeah, these are some silly pictures. So it's kind of a learning management system. And you can run videos, add trainings, etc. in there. And you can even use this mobile technology to find stuff. So if you want to, an operator to find certain valves, then you say, please find the valve, which is called S2406A. Well, then, uh, if you know, don't know where to go, then you don't know where to go. But it makes you think, and you have to scan the correct one, and then you get a good grade. If you scan the wrong one, you get a bad grade and have to do it again. And what we can do nowadays also is uh, integrate our software with existing learning management systems. So many uh, schools and also many uh, plants, they have their own man uh, learning management system. And we can put our software there as a web with a web-based interface. And then yeah, I typically look something like this. So you have just your browser, you fill in something and then you can come up with a screen like this and you can operate maybe a small piece of uh, equipment and train on that. And then this has nothing to do with modeling, but we came up with a spin-off idea uh, by this, which is nice to mention, just to mention it. And so, so many, uh, many plants, especially older plants, they have a lot of hand valves which are not automated. So you have no feedback, zero feedback in the control room if the valve is opened or closed. And maybe you have thousands of valves in your factory, but you don't know for sure if they're open or closed. So uh, typically the, the outside operator has to walk inside, uh, inside the plant and has to mark this valve is open, this one is closed, this valve is open, and then bring a book. And then when he's back in the control room, he has to put it in some Excel sheet or whatever. But it's always tricky. And especially when it's bad weather outside, then people may be not going outside and just, ah, this valve is always open, so let's check it. And that's where things can go wrong, right? In that case, it's really good that you can hang these tags because if you do your operator round, you just scan and mark, and it marks automatically if the valve is opened or closed. And in the control room, you can make an extra screen which shows you which lines are opened. Eh? So you mark them uh, with a thick line and which, file, which lines are closed with a small line. So if you're doing your operator rounds and, and you're saying to the operator inside, well, let's start pump A, then at least he can shout out, oh, let's not do that because you have lined up a pump B. Eh? Just a silly example. So the, the, this was uh, uh, on, on Mobatex, so some use cases of modeling. Uh, but for the use cases, you obviously need a model. So you need to get there. And that's what we typically do courses about. And this is just a very short scratch on the surface on that. So typically in the world, there are two uh, main approaches for modeling. On the one hand, you have the flow sheeting approach. And on the other hand, you have the equation-oriented approach. 
And the flow sheeting approach, and I, what, well, we tried to make the best of both worlds, by the way, and we call it equation and system based. I come on that. So you have this uh, flow sheeting approach. It's typically used for steady state modeling, and it has some advantages. You just pick some unit of equipment, you, you take them from a library, you put them on your flow sheet, you connect them together, and you fill in some parameters. You get all the mass and energy balances for free. You just have to define uh, some parameters and you click on run and you get your answers. Okay, so, so it works uh, a lot with predefined units. Uh, but it's very inflexible when you want to uh, incorporate a unit that's not in the library because then you have to build it yourself and you have to be a very good programmer if you want to be able to do that. So it's very good for standard pieces uh, of equipment and standard factories that works great but it's rather inflexible when you want to do something else which is not so typical and to uh, well uh, but at least you will not have any problems with the degree of freedom because typically the equations behind these units they are hidden you don't even know what you're doing as an engineer especially for students it's a bit tricky some students come to me they say well i'm very good at modeling but actually they're not they're just good at putting some stuff on the flow sheet and uh, making it run. But you have to know what's behind these models if you really want to understand. Okay, so typically it looks like this. These are these uh, flow sheet programs. They are very, very useful. They don't misunderstand me. And they have very much practical use. But if you want to really learn how this model is built up, then, then uh, well, you need to have another approach. And this approach is equation oriented which is mainly uh, for dynamic modeling. Eh? So you have to code everything. You have to build everything yourself, which is a lot of work, but you have complete freedom. So you can make anything you want, but there is not much options for predefined units, but it's extremely flexible eh? because well, you can type what you want and it will do what you want, but you will have quite a problem with the so-called degree of freedom analysis. So you have to determine which are the free variables, which are the constant variables. You will have to initialize your entire program. It's quite a bit of work and it will look like this. Eh? So a lot of code. And if something goes wrong in the code, well, then you've spent hours, days or weeks debugging this code. So it has advantages because it's very flexible. But it has disadvantages, it's hugely complex, and it's very hard to transfer it to another person who did not make the model. So, and this is what I found in academia, you learn a little bit about modeling, but typically it stops with the CSTR, the continuously stirred tank reactor, or you have a plug flow reactor, or you have a vessel in which A plus B gives you C, and that's a bit where it stops. And on the other hand, you have professional simulators and there you have, uh, I don't know, reactive uh, columns with multi-stages, et cetera, complex stuff. So there's quite a gap. And what we want to do with Mobile Tech Modeler is to make this gap a bit smaller and make people understand what are the models behind also the more complex simulations. And so, so what we do is uh, equation and system based, and I will uh, show you a little bit uh, more about it uh, in a minute. And also Vladimir will dive into it a bit more. The advantage is that you get your mass and energy balances for free, and you can use quite some stuff from a library, but you can also flexibly change it and look inside and change anything that you want. It makes it all uh, manageable, but uh, it's, it's, I will just give a demonstration in a minute and then you understand what I mean. So it looks a bit like a flow sheet, but it generates for you the code that is behind this flow sheet. So, but whenever modeling, uh, you should keep in mind that modeling is never a goal. It's a tool to get you somewhere. Right? So if you're just modeling because you want to have a nice model, that's not, not so handy. It has to have a goal. So for example, this operator training simulator, that's the goal. I want to train my operators and hence I need a model. So we should make this model. If you want to optimize my process, then I want to have a model of the process that I can do a lot of uh, scenarios and optimize my process without uh, spending a lot of uh, resources. Well, sometimes people say universal models uh, are great. So you have one model and it should solve everything. But typically that doesn't work because uh, the complexity should always be in line with the goal. Eh? So for example, if you have this, 
this is a CFD model. I don't know if you see it moving at your side, but it's a nice uh, moving picture. But if you're only interested, for example, in the uh, average temperature in such a pipe, well, then you quite overdid your modeling. You could have surfaced with just one equation. And this is way overdone. And because the, this is a lot of equations, maybe more than 100,000 uh, to solve this. And also a model cannot explain more than it's in it. Eh? So if you're heating a liquid, you can make a very simple model. Maybe you come up with an equation, but if then at some point in real life uh, this happens, then you missed something. Eh? Well, in this case, it's uh, obviously easy. We were boiling water and at 100 degrees, it starts boiling and the temperature stays the same. But if I didn't take that into account in my model, then it predicts something that's not correct. So you should be aware of the boundaries in which your model is valid. And so be aware, very aware of the purpose and of the assumptions and also the operating windows, because always the garbage in and garbage out uh, rule it always applies, right? And yeah, I just put also there, modeling is the art of leaving out. Uh, I see that a lot in academics. And people make these huge, huge, huge models, but uh, they don't uh, need to do that. Uh, oh, thank you very much. I get a piece of code <laughs> just because talking all this time. So, so you should keep a model uh, as simple as possible. Eh? Well, that's actually one of these. Yeah. So our models are wrong, and eh? that's a statement. But some are very useful. That said, uh, George Box, who was a statistician in the 19th century, and uh, this uh, well-known well-known piece, uh, a well-known line: models should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. He said Albert Einstein a long time ago. So, and we have a certain process, and we want to translate that process in the uh, equations that describe this process. But how do we do that? So. We have designed a modeling methodology for that. And this modeling methodology is implemented in our tool, which is called Mobatech Modeler. So it builds on certain uh, layers and certain steps. And you start with a physical topology. So you divide the process you have into smaller parts. You make the parts so small that you can describe them. And you break them down with two basic components. And these basic components they are called uh, systems and connections. And this is very important. So you have to, your process and you break it down in systems and connections. And the system, it represents a capacity. And this capacity is able to store mass and energy. And the systems are interconnected with connections. And the connections, they describe the transfer of mass and energy between the systems. But they don't have any mass or capacity themselves. So that's the abstraction you are going to use. And to make a simple example, so for example, I want to model a CSTR. Well, that's actually just one system because it can store mass and energy and there can be mass in and mass out. So two connections, one system, quite simple. But maybe uh, it's non-adiabatic and I want to also describe that. So there's a wall and there's an ambient temperature. Then I can describe it like this. I have actually two systems now, eh? so it's a system. This one can store mass and energy, but this wall, it has a mass, but it can also store energy, eh? so it can be dynamic. So now you have uh, two inlets, but you also have two uh, heat flows, one from the, the liquid to the metal and one from the metal to the ambient. But maybe I want to further extend it, and there's also a gas phase. And then I, I can extend my physical topology. So it's still, from the outside, it looks like the same model, but from the inside, I modeled it quite differently because now I have a liquid phase and I have a gas phase, which are two separate systems. In between, there is a phase change connection and they both are connected to this wall and they exchange heat with the environment. And maybe I want to further extend it. So I have a jacket. Well, then it could look like this. So this is this remains the same, but now cooling down on, or heating up and depends on your process, of course. You can have a piece of water that is cooling or heating this metal, but it's also uh, 
uh, in the metal box itself and exchanging heat with the environment. So you can make your model like this. The advantage is, is that you can physically see the assumptions that you're making, right? So you are assuming that there is some uh, heat loss going on. And you're assuming that there is mass, liquid mass coming in and liquid going out and gas also going out. So you can also do uh, a tray of a distillation column like this. So instead of modeling one tray, you actually model one, two, three systems and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine connections. And it looks like complicated, but in the end, it's actually very easy because you can define the physics of each object, of each modeling object. So for example, you can just define how the heat is transferred from this to this, but you can maybe use the same equation for this heat uh, connection and the same equation for this one and the same for this. So you, you only need to define the heat object one time and you can reuse it. And for transparency, then you can make it a bit more multi-layer. So for example, if you have a distillation column, you can break it down into several parts, eh? the, the top, the tray section, another tray section, the bottom. And if you zoom into a tray, you can have uh, it look like this. And you can take it even further. So this is a very big plant, which I can show you also in a minute. And you can zoom into an area and there you see all the PNIDs. And if you zoom into a PNID, you see how the PNID is built. But this is, for example, a sulfur incinerator, but you can even further zoom in in that case. And if you zoom into the incinerator, you see it consists of two parts, the incinerator part and the steam boiler. And you can zoom in further. You have here liquid and, uh, and gaseous uh, sulfur, and that gives it heat uh, to the hot gas, to the metal. And with that, you heat the boiler. But the boiler is obviously it's water, but it's also steam. So you can zoom in further and you see that here's uh, liquid water and gas water, you see? So you can zoom in very, very deep until you can define how you think the physical topology should look like. And at that point, uh, you should also introduce the components that are there. So you introduce which components and which reactions can take place. And from that information, it's actually trivial to uh, derive the balance equations. So that's something that our tool does automatically for you. So generating the balance equations is trivial, and that's why it's automated by Mobatech Modeler. And the only thing you have to do as a user is to define the details in the so-called constitutive equations. And so if you have a certain set of uh, systems interconnected with connections, then the state of a system uh, is... Uh, the fundamental extensive quantities, eh? so these are component mass and uh, energy, because for these, you can apply the conservation principles, which are very simple, because it just says the accumulation is whatever comes in minus what goes out, plus what is produced minus what is consumed. But that's very trivial, and the computer can do that for you. So what it is you have to define as a model uh, designer is the following. You have to define what are the transfer relations, what are the reaction rates, what are the thermodynamic relations, what are the property definitions. Uh, maybe there's control and equipment and some constraints. That's the things you have to define as a modeler. But for the uh, heat and balance, uh, heat and mass balances, it's quite trivial. So the computer can do that for you. And in the end, it's getting a little abstract. I know that, but it's so nice uh, to see how it works. So if you have uh, component mass and energy, it all boils down to uh, component mass and energy. It's a large interconnection matrix times all the flows plus a stoichiometric matrix times all the reactions. And then you have to define from the connections, you get all the flows. And the flow is typically driven by the difference of two uh, intensive properties. So if you have heat flow, it's typically driven by a difference in temperature. And temperature is an intensive property of a system. And the connection is connected between two systems. So if you have one system and another system, temperature here is uh, higher than there, then there is a heat flow going this direction. And something similar accounts for reactions. A reaction is typically driven by intensive properties of your system. 
So the reaction rate is determined by concentration, by temperature and pressure in the system. So what you need in the system is uh, a translation that translates the fundamental properties, which are component mass and energy, into these intensive properties. And when you think about it, it's always possible. Eh? So if you have the component mass and uh, the, the energy of your system, you can calculate the fraction, you can calculate the density, you can calculate the temperature, you can calculate the pressure, you can calculate the viscosity, et cetera, et cetera. So if you do that, you have all these and you can calculate back. And then it gives you this very nice picture, which was uh, a bit of the result of my uh, promotion, uh, doctoral promotion to study. So, and once you understand this picture, you actually understand the modeling, uh, which is great. And so you have a certain starting point at that time zero. And then you know all the component masses and all the energies. From that, you calculate pressure, temperature, viscosity, density, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And from that, because you have that, you can calculate the flow rates and you can calculate the reaction rates. You put them together in this uh, mass and heat balances and you calculate the mass and energy of the next time step and then you repeat. And this, this was just an example from a textbook and you can see that it applies. So this is just a very simple uh, a reactor uh, continuously stirred reactor with a simple reaction A to B, flow in, flow out in the reaction rate. So uh, if you look here, the flow rate in is some concentration time flow rate in. The flow rate out is the flow rate out times the concentration of this component. And if you look at the reaction rate, well, the reaction rate is some uh, constants times the concentration and the temperature. And if you look at the concentration, it's defined as uh, mass over volume. Huh? Uh, and when you look then at this definition and you, you go back, then this mass is then defined here. So there is a translation that the mass, you can translate it into concentration. The concentration is used here to calculate reaction rate. The concentration is also used to calculate flow rate. And same for temperature. Right? Temperature, it relates back to entropy and entropy is back used in the uh, heat balance equation. So I quickly wanted to show that. I see there is a message in the chat box. Ah, okay, okay. no problem. <laughs> I want to give you uh, some small examples in our software. And after the, the break, uh, Vladimir is going to take over and making a little bit of a deep dive. So what I showed you uh, during the presentation was a uh, operator training simulator. And for that, we model an entire process, complete process. So this is a factory. It consists of 10 areas. And if you zoom into an area, a mouse, I can double click, then you see each area consists of quite a number of PNIDs. And if you zoom into a PNID, for example, this one, you see it consists of the complete PNID. And if I go to the simulation mode, I can see all kinds of values. And I can now run the simulation and the, the values will change. Eh? And I can now, for example, uh, start the pump. And if I start the pump, uh, it will uh, drain here the, the level. You see the level is now uh, dropping a little bit. And because the level is changing, the pressure is changing, and you can uh, walk through the entire process. And it's uh, quite, quite a big uh, thing. So I will move back a little bit. So what's happening here, by the way, this is an entire factory and we calculate every second what would happen the next second. And this uh, it's close to 100,000 equations. So we have very strong software because every second we can calculate what the state of the new factory uh, would be. But what I can also do is to use this model uh, to, to show you the differences between uh, flow sheet modeling and equation-based modeling, which is very nicely visible on this uh, example. So for example, uh, if I zoom here, so you can use standard equipment in like a heat exchanger or a pump or whatever. It's very easy. Uh, but uh, this, what you see here, is a divided wall reactive column, where there's a very low chance that this is in your database. 
So you cannot just go here and fill in some parameters and, uh, and up you go. No, you have to model it yourself. So this is the strength of Mobile Tech Modeler. We can now double click and see how this thing is uh, internally defined. So you see here really the division and how is it working? You can zoom into the bottom and there you see there is a liquid phase. It's communicating with the gas phase. There is the red lines are heat. So there is heat loss to the metal and heat loss to the environment. And it is on this level that we define uh, the equations. So if I double click here, I click and what you see here that the heat is actually a heat transfer coefficient times an area times a difference in temperature. And this is a very simple equation. It's also used here. And what the tool does automatically for me, it makes me the balance equation. So the difference in energy is heat in minus heat out. So if I say, oh, this is not correct, I'm going to change it and I'm going to reconnect uh, this part to here. And what you see is that automatically the balance equation is adapted, you see. So you cannot make any mistakes with the heat balance and the mass balance because it's automatically set up for you. And that saves a lot of work. And what you can do in Mobatech Modeler is you can go outside and you can make any selection. And you can make a model of the part that you selected, which is extremely useful because you can just test and debug this selection. There. After that, you can test and debug this. And after that, this. And only then take it together because if you do it all at once, then typically it's too much and you will run into calculation errors. Eh? So if I do that, I can also have a look at what code would be generated. So you can look. And this is the code I should have typed uh, for making this column, eh, which is impressively difficult, of course. But if you do it using the system and connection methodology, it becomes a lot easier. Also, when I wanted to do this little change by reconnecting this heat connection, well, if I want to do that in this code, well, then I have to change something here and I have to add something there. I don't have to forget something here. It's very, very difficult. And this makes it a lot easier. And also, uh, Mobile Tech Modeler helps you a lot with setting up the equations yourself. And so if you start from scratch, you can either uh, take some library unit. Eh? So uh, maybe uh, there's some liquids. We have a vessel. You put it here, and I have a pump, and it you know, goes somewhere. And you can connect this with some valves, like this, this, etc. And now I can fill in some details. I can even use a pump curve editor and say, "Oh, this is my pump," and and apply this, and just apply some standard values. That's all possible. But if you're not agreeing with the equations behind it, you can always dive in and have a real look at the actual equations and change them. But what you can also do is start completely from scratch. So you say, well, what I have is uh, I have a system. And I have another system. Oh, click wrong. And in between that, I have, for example, heat connection. And now the system will help you because now it says here, oh, you have improper equations. And why is that? I can have a look at the equations. Equations is because I have, uh, there's a heat flow and it needs to be known because it's used in the balance equation here and here. So I can either select it and it said, oh, it's a fixed heat flow. Now I can fill in some value. Maybe it's uh, 10. Or, or whatever, and I can even change here to British thermal units or, or kilowatts or whatever. That's all possible. But it's a bit silly, of course, to have a fixed heat flow. So what you can also do is not select it and define an equation. Maybe you can use one that's predefined, maybe this one. And now, uh, no, there's still a problem. So why is that? It's now because there is now one equation, but now there are three unknowns. So either you add more equations, or you define the ones you know. So if you want to keep it simple, you say, oh, I have a fixed heat transfer coefficient at this time, and I have a fixed area. And then it says, oh, okay, now I have enough information and I can calculate from this. And this is how you step-by-step step, uh, do your modeling. 
Uh, and in the end, you can give it any visualization you want. Eh? So I can close this one and I can show you another example. Let me show you something. So for example, this one. So this one is, uh, this is a simple model. This is a heat exchange, but it looks completely different. And this is used for training. So now we made some face plates like this and all this, you can all define the Mobotech modeler. So you can do your own drawings. You can make your own uh, little face plates like this. You can put it on manual and on automatic, uh, and maybe open the valve and then automatically things will start happening, you see? And then you can have a look. Uh, I don't know, maybe there's also a picture somewhere. Just clicking a bit. <laughs> Well, this one has a drawing, you see. And this is just one of the visualizations. So we have other ones as well. So let me have a look. Uh, so I can close this one and open another one. Uh, here we have the mobile factory. This one we use for demonstrations also when we are somewhere. So it looks a bit similar, but uh, well, the face plates are completely defined differently. And the plotting is done differently. You can open the valve, close it. And this one we typically, uh, I use this one to show people how this uh, mobile technology works. So we have this. And this pump, you can only operate uh, with with this telephone. Oh, but I didn't switch it on now, so I, can, I cannot show you. It was very nice because I, I could uh, click on the phone and then you could see that uh, something was changing on the model. So this is communicating via internet uh, to this model. That's for the next time. And, uh, <laughs> let me show you another thing. So that's that's another uh, uh, look and feel that we have. Uh, let's go back here. And this one, this was one uh, that one of our clients made actually. And what we do there is we even have tasks. So you have to perform a certain task. And you have two tries left, so you have to find certain stuff. And this one also has uh, little face plates here. I'll close this one. And for this one, we even did a whole alarm system. So it's looking impressive, right? Uh, or you already have uh, these uh, these plots showing up. We even have uh, an, an alarm page. So if you trip the plant, I don't know how we, we can probably do that. Oh, emergency shutdown buttons, so shut down the plant. And then a lot of stuff will happen, you see? So this is obviously, uh, this is an application of modeling. And sometimes we build these models for our clients and then we do all the modeling and the client just wants to learn how to operate this thing. Uh, and sometimes uh, the client wants to make uh, their models uh, themselves. So what we can do here is I can move back and here. And this one I know by coincidence, obviously, that uh, we define the model over here. So the actual model, for example, the compressor here, that's, uh, that's over here. So we put it on simulate, you see all the actual values. And this is where you can do the debugging. So we have quite some tools for debugging. So for example, if I'm interested in uh, say the temperatures everywhere, I can open a special window. This window has all the variables, but I can also filter them and say, I want to see the temperatures and I want to see the temperatures only of the selection. I make a selection or I can make a larger selection and then you can do your debugging. Eh? So this is all running automatically. 
and you can uh, open and close valves while it's running. So I can open this valve while the stuff is running. Close it again. So just to give you an idea and an impression of what you can do with modeling, and now you can uh, build it with Mobitech Modeler. And the idea was uh, that I spent about an hour talking about this. And then in the next session, uh, my colleague uh, Vladimir will dive in just a bit deeper and tell you how you can do this yourself. We actually have a free course. I want to point to you to that uh, now. If you don't mind, so Vladimir will probably also mention that to you. So uh, what we have here, uh, I can go to Mobatech. So if you type in uh, www.mobatech.nl, you will come here and you can press free online course. And when you put your email here and you put your name, you can get access. Well, obviously uh, I have access already. And then what you get is a nice explanation and we do uh, some exercises which you can do for free. So when you do this, you will get a free uh, mobile tech model license for 30 days and you can play around with the software as long as you want. Uh, not as long as you want for 30 days. <laughs> and then, uh, well, you can ask us questions if you want. So you can uh, have a look around in our software, which is, um, by definition, it's equation-based software, as I showed you here. So in the end, we are very interested in the equations that are behind this and solving those equations. So it's not your typical flow sheeter. It's, uh, it's an equation-based uh, modeling tool, which is very flexible and you can solve a lot of uh, interesting uh, problem, problems for our clients. This was about the eight minutes, right, Joel? Yes, we, yes, sir. Thank you so much. Oh, good. Dr. Matthew. I hope uh, people could Thank follow so it a little bit. Uh, not, not everybody left the meeting. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I hope it was interesting. Yeah, I All took right. a little bit, a little bit of a dive uh, inside, but I also wanted to stay a bit on the surface to show you the applications of what you can do with modeling and what uh, people are interested in. So I mainly focused a little okay. bit on operator training simulators because well we do that a lot and uh, and it's easy to understand what the goal is of the model. So that's why I stuck to that. All right. And no, if there are any great. questions, Thank I'm very, so very much. happy to answer them. Okay, we would uh, get back to you during the Q&A section. That's very good. Training. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. So, so what's now? What's next? I forgot. We we'll, we'll have a five minute uh, break, ah, and then we'll okay. get back to. This. Great. Okay. Thank you. So, then I will yeah. shut down my camera and uh, we'll drink my Coca Cola. <laughs> okay. All right. See you soon, guys. What? All right. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. Um, we are going for a five minute break now. Um, so um, we'll come back in five minutes. I trust you have had a good time so far with Dr. Matthew and that one. Um, after the five minute uh, break, we would have um, uh, engineer Vladimir Bradovich to continue uh, for about 18 minutes. Then we'll have some other um, Parts to the uh, to event and then we wrap up today. So five minutes break it is. We we'll come back by five twenty five, five twenty five. All right. So that's that. Thank you so much. So please stay tuned. We advise not to log out. Just hang in, hang on. Come back five twenty five. That's about four minutes time. I hope you all can hear me. Please, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, 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 we can hear you. Hello? Okay, great. Yes, so 5.25 it is, four minutes time. Thank you so much. So you can just take, take a walk, just take a glass of water, just come back.
questions, please do want to drop all your questions and comments in the chat box. That will be very useful uh, during the Q&A session to make it a seamless process. So drop your questions and comments in the chat box to make it a smooth uh, transition. Thank you so much. All right, um, it's time already. So um, I would like to call on the uh, hello everyone. Vladimir Obradovich here. Maybe I can. If everybody hears me, I can. Hi, Vladimir. I can hear you. Yes. yes. Good. <laughs> Then I will introduce myself briefly, and then we can continue with the with this session. So my name is Vladimir Obradovic. I am a chemical engineer by training. I am originally from Serbia, and after I finished my uh, chemical engineering here in Belgrade, I uh, continued my uh, engineering doctorate uh, in uh, in the Netherlands in Eindhoven, uh, where I focused on multi-phase reactor modeling and particularly uh, distributed uh, parameter system systems modeling. Of course, there I met Matthew. He was teaching a modeling um, course. And uh, after my um, my um, education was done, I started working for Mobotech. And since then, it has been almost um, 11, 11 years. So uh, by the way, thank you for for uh, for inviting us for this uh, nice, uh, nice uh, webinar. So I'm going to uh, share my screen. And then we are going to continue. Let me just uh, do this. Okay. So now you should be able to see my screen. Yes. Okay, yes, great. Let me okay. 
So Matthew, thank you for a very nice uh, uh, presentation and uh, explaining what are the fields that dynamic models can be applied to, as well as um, uh, showing a bit our software. I'm going to focus uh, a bit more on how do we get to these uh, dynamic models? How do we build them? What are the main, uh, the main concerns uh, to, to build it, yeah? So it's uh, the same like if you want to build a house, yeah? You have to think of, uh, of the materials. What do you need to build it with? So do you need uh, steel, uh, concrete, uh, wood, or whatever? And then you need to know how to put it all together such that you make a functional house. So it's, it's kind of the same with, uh, with, uh, with models and dynamic models uh, specific. We need to uh, think about what are the parts. So how do we actually build uh, a, a model that will be functional so that will, uh, after receiving some inputs, uh, provide us with some outputs that we can use uh, to solve certain problems. So I will solve, I will circle a bit, a bit more back uh, on the approaches towards modeling, but I will explain it. So it's nice that we repeat this. I will explain it a bit more from the, from the uh, user perspective uh, and uh, what you can expect. So. Same stuff, but I will cover this in the beginning just a bit, uh, a bit differently. And it's nice that we repeat uh, some of the of the things because these are some of the things that you should know if you are about to do any type of uh, of modeling. So we normally have, as Matthew already already showed a bit, we have two approaches towards modeling. One is the so-called flow sheeters, um, the the upper one, where you can use just drag and drop uh, modeling. And the main thing about these models are that they are, we can call them a gray, gray box model. So not the, the black box model, they're not data driven models, but they're gray box because as Matthew also implied, you cannot see the equations behind these units and they work okay for the standard units uh, in giving you uh, steady state estimates because most of the time these are steady state models. So solving for one steady state um, operation of a certain uh, factory or part of the factory. They are uh, low in flexibility in terms that you cannot change anything, yeah, because you don't have access to these um, to these equations. They have um, a drawback, uh, as most of them are uh, solved sequentially. So you would software will solve the first unit, then the second unit, and then the third unit, and then if there is a recycle, it would again solve the, the first unit, and it would iterate until it uh, closes the error tolerance and then reaches uh, the solution. So this is actually suited for um, for uh, uh, steady state uh, steady state models. But uh, during these iterations, uh, problems can occur because not all equations are solved at once, uh, but uh, sequentially. So you can expect some um, some problems with convergence with this type of uh, software. They are really good. Uh, for uh, rough estimates, so to do a process estimation or to do process feasibility study. And uh, most of the time in the in, in real industry, uh, they're used uh, in a way that uh, you would make a, a model of your process with uh, this flow sheeter type uh, software, and you would uh, tune, tune, tune until uh, change parameter values until you get uh, to match your own um, uh, production. And then if something changes in your production, uh, you would put these parameters in, but you would not get a good match. So you would have to do it again. So um, they're not the best in that way, but they're good to be used as to use reverse engineering such that once you get it uh, to, to match, you can check some parameters that you used in your, uh, your software and uh, that can be of, of, of certain value depending of, of what it is. The main a plus or a negative that is um, up to the point of view is that uh, normally no knowledge uh, is needed on these models. So as Matthew also mentioned, you can just take it from the library, plug it in. Um, you, you will input uh, parameters like pressure, temperatures, or, or uh, uh, molar fractions, whatever that uh, it's needed for the certain uh, type of unit, and you'll get some answers, but the main uh, the main, uh, so the plus is that you don't have to model it. You don't have to do anything but input these parameters. But we know that there is a saying gar garbage in, garbage out, which means that if you supply uh, wrong uh, inputs, then uh, the model will give you wrong outputs. So it's uh, a double-edged sword in that sense. So you really have to take care of understanding or at least reading the documentation if there is uh, any to understand what is uh, the unit doing actually 
So it's a plus because it's easy to use. And if you don't want to bother on the details, it's probably good enough. So again, the modeling goal here is, um, is, um, is important. If this is enough, then this will be a great, uh, great software for you because it's going to be easier. But if you really want to know what's happening and uh, you need to make some decisions based on the detailed um, reports of this model, then uh, probably you would need to dig deeper to find the documentation and understand what is happening uh, with certain units such that you can know uh, whether you can trust these results or not. So this is a double-edged sword. Then we have the equation-oriented, which Matthew also explained a bit. And uh, these are mainly focused on uh, its, its coding-based environment where you code your, your equations and you know exactly what you did because you are the one uh, doing these, uh, making these models. Or if somebody else made models, then you can uh, enter and see the code and see the equations. And we call these models white box models because uh, you, they are normally greeted with a white uh, coding uh, sheet. So uh, you can see the equations, which is, which is great. Um, they're highly flexible because you can change all of the equations, but uh, in, terms of or in terms of transparency, they're quite uh, low because you can end up with, uh, with 10 and 15 or, or 20 uh, pages of code. And then even for the person who wrote the code, it takes time to uh, make changes. And uh, as Matthew showed, uh, due to the lack of, uh, of um, connecti uh, connectivity due to different, uh, different units that you code, because it's all a single piece of code, you have to, if you change something, you have to go and change it, make sure that you change it everywhere where it matters or else you will get an error. And sometimes it takes time to realize that you have an error because it doesn't have to be a big error. So, um, and this is how you get the low level modeling errors, um, uh, which, uh, which, are, which, are, which take time to correct. And uh, anyhow, the, the, the transparency is quite, uh, quite low. Uh, there is no recycle problems as these uh, models are solved implicitly. Uh, they're so-called uh, generic solvers. So all equations are solved at once. Uh, as I said, knowledge on the model is needed. Uh, they are good for high fidelity simulation. So we really, uh, if we use first principle models, as Matthew already explained a bit, then we can really uh, hope to get some high fidelity results if we apply that to each part of our, of our, of our model. Yeah? And uh, one of the also uh, negatives, let's say, is that you would need to develop, acquire a programming skills depending on the software that you use. So for the MATLAB, it's, it's a different syntax. For uh, GPROMS, uh, it's different syntax. For Aston Custom Modeler, it's a bit different again. So you would need uh, to spend some time and learn how to uh, program your equations such that you get the code that will work and that you can get some solutions. And for many people, um, I saw so far in, in my career, this programming part was, uh, was quite challenging uh, besides uh, making the equations on the paper, let's say. So you get your model straight, you know what you want to do, but just programming it, um, it can be uh, problematic for some people or even they, they can do it, but they, they're just not good at it uh, in the longer stretch and they're, they're, they're not as proficient as they could be since they have the physical knowledge, but it's this uh, programming part that it's um, taking the, their time away. So these are, just wanted to cover again, these uh, two approaches because uh, they are very important. So, and again, uh, as Matthew already showed you, so when we put the best of the two worlds, we get equation and system-based approach, and we have a, com a combination of good, uh, or probably uh, uh, the best um, of both worlds. So we get white box models and knowledge of the models is needed. So. Of course, again, if we are talking about high fidelity simulations, you need to know what you're uh, modeling and you need to know what are the equations because if you have to debug it, you can never debug a model if you don't know what's being solved inside. So it's, it could be uh, very hard to do that. So you actually kind of, it's a prerequisite. You need the knowledge on the models um, and uh, in order to, to, to make uh, high fidelity simulation. Models are quite flexible and highly transparent. As you saw what Matthew already showed, because we use um, physical topology, the composition, then each uh, small part of the model uh, is uh, representing a certain phenomen phenomenological um, part of the process, like a heat transfer or a, it's, a, it's a vessel and there is a liquid and gas phase. So you can even uh, in immediately know, even if you haven't made this model, you can just click and see how this is gas phase. This is a liquid phase. This is phase change connection. And if you click on each of these model objects, you'll be able to see equations that represent that uh, phenomenological part. 
And that's uh, really, really uh, speeding you up to immediately understand the assumptions that the, the guy who, or, or girl, a person who, who made the model uh, uh, did. So also we have no recycling problems as we use implicit solvers to solve all equations at once. It's very good for high fidelity simulations and that is uh, mainly um, our line of work. Programming skills are not needed. This is uh, something that uh, Matthew implied. So uh, it, with, with our software, you would need to uh, learn uh, a few like five or 10 syntactic uh, rules and then you can write your equations uh, almost as on paper. So then software will pick that up and uh, so make a code as Matthew already showed and then you'll be able to simulate. So programming skill is not needed. There are no four loops in Mobotech Modeler. So, um, it's just plain uh, straight uh, equations, uh, almost as on paper, and then uh, physical topology and equation topology with that will, uh, and later assistance with the software as implied here. So there is assistance on initialization. We will learn about that today. That will be the most, uh, um, uh, one of the most important takeaways from today and assistance on degrees of freedom or how do we make our model well posed? How we make them solvable, yeah? So that's, uh, that's, um, that's going to be important. As I already said, equations are written as on paper, code is generated automatically. And because of this uh, physical uh, topology decomposition, which Matt already showed, you will see uh, complex models uh, look and feel like a sum of simple models. So that is um, um, a great uh, plus and it's easier actually to handle, initialize and, um, and get your results, results out. So, just uh, going to circle back uh, for, for a minute here. Uh, Matthew showed something similar. So uh, there is you with your, with your plant, uh, processing plant, and then you have in mind uh, the model that you want to make. So you, you have some equations and then software will help you to make software will automatically generate this code. And from there you will get the results. Uh, I'm going to focus from now on, on this second part. So how to construct the model such that we can generate, such that software can generate um, equations, uh, generate the, so the code that can solve the equations that we used to get us uh, to our results. So this is the part that we are going to, to focus mostly um, in this presentation. So from the user's perspective uh, regarding Mobotech Modeler, it is an equation-based flow sheeter, which Matthew already showed a bit, yeah? Custom equation-based modeling and drag and, drag and drop flow sheeting is available. No programming skills are needed, just some simple syntax that you need to learn to write equations um, inside of your uh, model objects, uh, systems or connections. You are able to do manual model initialization, and this is really important. We will also learn how to do this today and how this, how this work, because many times uh, with softwares, uh, uh, these initializations are automatic and many times they just fail. And normally what you have to do then, I'm speaking now from the practical experience, uh, you would have to reduce your model size. Normally this happens with some larger unit models with uh, conventional equation oriented modeling where you use code. So you would have to reduce your, your code, uh, take out maybe energy balance or something else and then try to initialize it, run it like that, uh, save the solutions, then add uh, equations and then initialize it from there. But if you have, if you have the ability to manually initialize um, dynamic models, then, then it will, um, it will be, uh, for you, it will be possible to, to set up this the way you like it and to always get consistent uh, initial points. So it's, uh, it's quite um, a big um, a plus for the software to have this kind of uh, capability. And also, you will see it later, help you in the process. So it will let you know if the model is well posed and if the initial value problem is well posed, which is easy with some uh, simple models, but it becomes increasingly hard if we have uh, 20, 50 and more equations uh, that we need to solve. Again, equation physical topology exists such that we, again, do not have to have uh, 50 equations or 100 equations in, in a single system, but we can break that down into meaningful uh, phenomenological parts and then solve or initialize be before we start to solve it, each of these parts. And then these, uh, these parts will look like smaller models, but together they will be build uh, one large model. So just to cover once more the modeling purposes, uh, of dynamic uh, modeling. So obviously for dynamic simulation uh, analysis for unit and process model-based innovation. So sometimes you have an idea of the unit which does not exist yet. And uh, before you start building it and spending uh, sometimes millions of dollars, 
you can uh, actually model the operation if you know, um, if you have in mind what are the properties of this unit and you can see whether it will work and actually you can optimize it and then uh, build um, uh, the unit that will actually work. We can also do real-time training simulators as Matthew already showed in great extent. We can uh, uh, test process control and find optimal uh, pro uh, process control strategies once we have dynamic models built. We can also test uh, of the optimal uh, operational procedures. So what is the turn of event in startup, shutdown, or switching from one product to the product with different properties. And also we can use dynamic models or processes to test uh, process safety and uh, environment uh, impact to see how our process um, uh, behaves in certain uh, conditions where we don't want to be. Uh, and we have little data, but if we do a high fidelity model, then we can test and see how pressures, temperatures, um, uh, buildups um, go, and then we can predict what will happen and then design the units such that they can handle these um, disturbances. Yeah. So model decomposition, Matthew already uh, showed a bit, so I'm going to just uh, speak uh, plainly a bit uh, over the top. Here is just one uh, uh, nice maybe um, comparison. If you take on the if you take a look in the on the left, uh, you can see a conventional equation based models. So these are all these colors, and you cannot really tell if I would ask you where is the uh, where is the the, the 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 crossing between red and yellow maybe it's it's uh, blurry because you cannot see immediately yeah and on the right we have a, a mod mobotic uh, modeler model decomposition methodology where we decompose to certain parts and then it's clear what is red what is green what is blue it's a color analogy hopefully it was um, helpful because we don't have to take a look at the huge piece of code like matthew showed you in the end but we can just take a look at our, at our model uh, physical topology parts and see which equations are, are, are there. So in this case, we could uh, identify three systems and then we can identify connections between them, all the connections that they, there could be. So it becomes much more, uh, much more transparent and easier to, to handle, understand um, than just regular uh, uh, plain uh, code uh, in front of you. So. We are going now to um, take a look just briefly into the modeling environment of a Mobotech modeler. So I know you cannot learn anything uh, from just uh, showing you today, but I'm just going to take and show you just some, some uh, simple uh, int introduction before we focus on our main goal, and that is to learn how to make well-posed models and well-posed initial value problems. Yeah. So. Here, as Matthew already showed you, similar example, you have our um, modeling environment, we have uh, menus uh, and toolbars at the top, and then we have a bit uh, different than, uh, than other softwares. Normally you will have on the left a uh, fixed uh, tree structure with all the options, while in our software, this is a floating uh, property browser and property selection. So whenever you select something in the property brow browser, uh, in this bigger window, which we call properties of selection. Uh, the selection will show you actually what uh, what you can do. And also you can see, which is also nice, uh, something we call conditional formatting. Uh, this is a sulfur incinerator. We have a molten sulfur coming in and uh, dry air coming uh, in as well. We are uh, with ignition of, of flame, we are burning uh, sulfur producing a lot of SO2. Um, and then we use this heat to produce some um, low pressure steam. And you can see that there is a blue line coming which represents uh, liquid uh, water and there is a red line going out representing uh, steam and this is actually also dynamically it can, it can change if we want um, if we have flow or not do not have flow so it implies to the user what's happening before even taking a look at the equations but in this picture you can see uh, the results you can see this valve we selected and we can see now here the equations so it looks like a flow sheeter but if we select any of the model objects we can see that we have uh, equations that we can uh, that we can check and change or add totally new new equations as well. So you will learn this in the introduction course. I added the link and Matthew also explained that you can just register uh, and you will get access. But just to mention, so these um, property browser and, and, and properties uh, you can also hide. And if you select these two button, these two check boxes, they will hide as you can see on the right. Not that uh, important, but just wanted to give you some introduction to the software itself. 
In the property browser, we have some um, uh, expected things. So the first is the general folder where we have basic commands folder where we, we will find the models, uh, uh, the example models. Then we can find uh, models that we opened already, some thermal definitions. What is uh, what I wanted to show you is that uh, we have these uh, insert objects where we can use it to take uh, models from the library and connections from the from the library um, and other objects. And if you make a selection of any objects, then you you have these are all the uh, model objects that are available in Mobitech Modeler, which is which are systems, connections, text, buttons, uh, value objects, and plots. Doesn't mean much to you now, but you will uh, see once you start uh, the course. So if we, for example, go to insert objects and we select uh, models from library, then as Matthew briefly showed you, we can see, uh, we can select each group and then uh, scroll to find the unit that we would like to use. Again, these models uh, have automatic initialization. So they will initialize automatically. They, they have this autom automatic routine, but if you want uh, to do it a bit differently, you can always go and initialize them uh, manually. And we will learn about that uh, a bit later. As well, you can use uh, models from the scratch, as Matthew already showed. So continue with the, with the software a bit more, just to give you uh, some more information. Um, there in the software, there is a so-called so control deck where we can monitor everything that we introduced. Yeah? So we can see what are the variables that we used, what are the equations, what are the species and reactions, and some other stuff that are a bit advanced for, for today. But why this is important if we go to variables normally in the coding environment so in the regular conventional uh, equation or reacting softwares you have to code everything so if you say first you have to code your variables and then you start with your equations and and so on and so on but a uh, problem can occur if for example you use um, you use uh, uh, diameter and you use symbol d for diameter and you type 100 meters for some length of the pipe and that is in meters and maybe uh, later in the process, you get some data which are in inches. Yeah, So you have to make this conversion yourself. And sometimes you will forget about it. You will think that it is in meters or, or maybe you use wrong conversion. And that is how you introduce low level uh, modeling errors and you introduce factors. Or if it is uh, cubic meters per second, if you're talking about the volumetric flow, maybe it is cubic meter per hour. So then you introduce uh, 3,600 uh, factor to your calculation. And sometimes it takes time to, to, to find this. So not to have this problem, a Mobotech modeler offers you a, um, a layer on top where you can define your variables and define the unit category as, as written here. So you will define that this is length. We use SI system as basic uh, system, system international as basic units. So meters, kilograms per second, uh, cubic meters per second, kilogram, but uh, there is, as Matthew showed briefly, there is a conversion. So when you're uh, you're entering the parameters, you will you'll be able to choose any unit that you want and uh, enter it in that unit and the conversion will be done automatically. So this way we preserve uh, uh, the, the modeler from making this low level of modeling errors and, uh, and keeping uh, the model consistent um, uh, with the units. Yeah? And in this case, with the, with the different units, so the unit is okay, maybe it's meter, but not to use inches or, or millimeters or, or something else to introduce these factors because then calculations won't be uh, reliable anymore. So this is uh, uh, this is for the variables. Then we have a uh, tab for the equations. And here you will find all the equations that you have created uh, uh, making your model. Yeah. So at the top, you can see that this is the name of your model. And if you have multiple models open, open you can change this uh, selected database and find the equations that you need. So the a good thing here is that um, if you make certain equations and you want to use them again, you don't have to go through the code to find them, to copy them, to paste them again. Uh, you can just uh, enter and, uh, and find the equations that already exist because you have, a, you have created an equation database and you can just add these equations uh, to your, um, to your uh, model parts that uh, need, uh, need equations. So you don't have to um, copy anything. You'll also introduce errors maybe with the typos, but you just uh, add um, other equations that are already there because you already made them. So this is another way, uh, the same, this same layer like for variables that helps you, um, uh, helps you maintain your uh, model build it faster and maintain it uh, 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 syntax problem free because 
here, if you're going to make a, an equation, uh, the software will tell you if the equation is is good because if it is not, it will not uh, you will it will not allow you to save the equation, and we will see that in a second. On the right, also uh, one more uh, help for the modeler is there is an equation filter in terms of what type of equation, because when you make equation, you can assign a certain class, so. You can tell you can you can tell the software this is system equation. So this equation will pop up only when you select the system to be able to add this equation, so that you don't get again all the equations. Maybe it's a large model and then it's hard to uh, to find it. So you can assign equation class, and that will help you greatly to um, to have only the equations for that type of model object, like connections, or or system, or um, how it's called phase change connections or reaction uh, equations. All of these have their own equation class. Maybe it looks a bit confusing, but it's actually there to to help you to um, to be more efficient with all of this uh, classification. Of course, you can always select any equation and go and edit the equation. And main thing is, equation will be changing every occurrence in your model. So you don't have to go through code and change the equation every time uh, you use it in the code, which can be a tedious job if the if code is large. But once you change it here, it will be changed automatically um, everywhere. And actually, the same goes with the variables. If you want to change the variable uh, symbol or you want to change a variable unit, if you change it here, then it will change everywhere, which will uh, uh, make sure that everything is consistent and save you a lot of time. Then we have a species tab where we can see all the species that you use. In this particular example, we have air, water, and polyethylene uh, glycol. And you have also your reaction stub um, where you can see all the reactions that you have um, used in your model. And it's quite easy and straightforward to, uh, to define. We won't talk much about it. We have some other features like equation objects, user routines, and external functions. But these are some advanced features that uh, we just uh, don't have time to, to talk about um, today. So model building elements. We have physical, uh, physical topology. That is the first thing. Matthew already covered this, so I'll go a bit uh, from the other angle, let's say. So the first thing is that we build our physical topology, whether do we use uh, library units or we use our own um, uh, units, uh, well, uh, um, our own uh, systems from the scratch. Then once we add our topology, our systems and connections, then we need to add species. Uh, and you need to add species only once. The species, if there is a mass connection, will be able to propagate, like in the real situation. If there is a pipe, then uh, something can go through it. And we can actually also control uh, where a certain species goes. And that should be taken, uh, uh, that should be do with, uh, that should be done with, 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 uh, with care because you can sometimes block certain species going somewhere, but it should go. So it's, uh, it's a possibility, but of course, uh, one has to think about, about it when doing. And we have the third part, which is equation topology, which will follow the physical topology because we will define equations in the physical um, physical uh, physical topologies, which will represent that part of the physical topology, whether that is a gas uh, phase, a liquid phase, a column wall, or whatever that it is. So equation and physical topology are related in that sense. Yeah. So. Just to mention again, we have two types of elementary systems. We have capacity systems, which are able to uh, store mass and energy. So these systems will generate uh, mass and energy balances, the order differential equations that will be solved every second, while we, while or every second, every every integration step, step may be one second, two seconds, or 0 0.01 second. That is up to us how fast we want to progress in time. And we have battery limit systems, which are used uh, normally for um, uh, for boundary conditions. So battery limit or boundary condition, that is the same thing. So this is where we define our pressures, temperatures, uh, molar fractions. And this is the because when you make a model, you need to have a scope of the model. And the scope needs to end somewhere. Yeah. So this is for the beginning and the end of the model. No matter how many beginnings and the ends are, that will be defined by your scope. But this is when we use these battery limit systems, and they do not uh, generate. They do not. Uh, they cannot store mass and energy, and will not generate uh, mass and energy balances. Then we have two type of main main type of connections. We have mass connection, green by default. This is changeable, but this is how we use it. And um, in this green one, so we have a mass transport and 
Additionally, if we have uh, non-isothermal systems, we will have also the accompanying energy transport, which is called advantage, advantage heat transport as any mass that flows. It has certain um, uh, heat capacity, it has certain temperature, so it will store a certain amount of, of the energy. So it will have some entropy flow, yeah? While this red one is for pure uh, heat transfer, where we just have convection or conduction or something, something like that, or radiation, yeah? Then we have some additional systems which are there to help you. The first one is repetitive structure system. And this is used, for example, as Matthew already showed you, distillation columns. So sometimes uh, there will be a large distillation column with 50, 60, even 80 trays. And it would be very, very tedious if we would have to make 80 physical uh, trays. Yeah, So that's um, just a lot of work. So. When we have this type of distributed uh, elements, a cascade of uh, same elements, we can use these repetitive structures, made one element and just tell it it is repetitive structure and uh, set the number of repetitions to 20, 50 or 80. And uh, then it will uh, distribute the values so we can get the, the response of entire column and see the, the pressure, temperature, um, uh, molar fractions uh, for the each tray. So we don't have to build physically 80 trays, um, but we can build only only uh, three, for example, bottom, top, and in the middle, we would add 78 repetitive uh, trays, which will just be plugged in one to another. And uh, we use that to simulate uh, large repetitive structures. And we also have information systems, and these systems are used to calculate things that are not related uh, to the process uh, uh, um, variables uh, themselves in terms of flow, temperature, and pressure. Maybe we will send some information to these systems and maybe calculate conversion or something in that um, in that manner. Also, these will not uh, these will not recognize any species and will not uh, store um, mass and energy. For the connections, we have three more uh, connection types. We have this light green by default, um, which is phase change connection, and this is useful because we use uh, thermodynamical calculations to calculate molar entropy, molar volume, and fugacity coefficients for the phase driving uh, force. So if we have different uh, calculation uh, properties for the uh, package for the gas and liquid, we can define them as different phases. And then the only way to connect uh, these phases with mass is to use a phase change connection. Otherwise, it's liquid to liquid, so it's just a regular mass connection. So we use this to go from one calculation uh, property package to the next phase, which has different uh, calculation property package. Let's say in the liquid, we need to use Peng robinson equation of state to calculate molar entropy and molar volume, while we have a low pressure and gas components that behave ideally. So then for the gas, we can select ideal um, um, law for the gas. So then we would use um, this phase change connection to connect uh, these two uh, different phases because they are in fact uh, different. This yellow by default connection is to send information. So we can send a variable values like level value or a concentration or something else. And then uh, normally connect that to other capacity system or information system and use that information to calculate uh, something. Yeah. And the third uh, is the work connection. And that is um, uh, if you have a work performed in a certain unit, like a centrifugal pump, maybe compressor, uh, then uh, we can dissipate heat, uh, uh, work through heat to our uh, to the to the fluid, and this is where you can use these connections, which will build into the energy balance automatically. So again, what Matthew uh, showed you briefly, this is um, this is um, the composition of one uh, distillation distillation column. Yeah, so we have a column, then we can see that we have reboiler condenser and the tower then we can have top section rectifying section bottom sweeping section and then we can divide it into single trays and then we can divide each tray to liquid uh, and and vapor and this phase change connection in between and this is uh, for us um, uh, really important because this is how we decompose large models and make them feel um, and also for the for solving them uh, be easy as to solve a lot of simple models to get a large model uh, solved. So again, Matthew already mentioned this, so I will just uh, go about regarding species topology. Some um, practical things for the software: the, the, the species database counts more than two thousand species. So you will probably find 
what you need in order to uh, to model it. And if uh, that is not the case, uh, we can always add new species uh, to to existing uh, database or to a special database if the project is um, um, uh, requires that. So now we come a bit closer to um, equation topology. Yeah, if you select any any system, any capacity system which can store mass and energy, this uh, system will form mass and energy balance. And if you take a look at the at the right in this uh, dark uh, mobotic blue, we can see that we have here component mass balance, and below that we have entropy balance. And this is these are the differential equations. We have DDT operator, which means uh, differential of uh, number of moles over time equals. And then we have uh, the mass connections that, that are coming out with the sign of minus. So mass connection 63 and 65. And we have mass connections that are coming in, uh, uh, which, which is uh, mass connections uh, 62 and 64. And this is Fn, which is a predefined variable for the component molar flow. And this uh, balance will be, will be formed. If we take uh, a look below for the entropy balance, so we have uh, first, uh, two pure connections, pure uh, com uh, pure heat connections. So we have a connection H0066 uh, coming to the system and uh, connection uh, H heat uh, 67 uh, going out of the system. And we have the advective heat flow for the mass connections, which are used to build uh, the mass balance. So 63 and 65 uh, going heat flow going out and 62 and 64 heat coming in. So this will be generated automatically, like Matthew showed you. If you just connect mass connections to the or heat connections uh, to the capacity system, this will form automatically. If we delete these connections, uh, these components will disappear from the energy and mass balance, which is quite uh, good news because we do not have to adopt them uh, manually. Yeah. Below this, in this light blue uh, square, we can see uh, the equations that are called so-called constitutive equations because they constitute uh, the, the, the system. And Matthew uh, covered uh, what type of these uh, they can be. But here we can see that we have uh, equations for a total molar holdup, component molar holdup, uh, entropy, pressure of the liquid, uh, specific entropy, specific volume, volume, uh, and some other equations. And you can choose how you want to show them you can see here is it uh, show equations or with names or equation and names you can also add descriptions as well and then your transparency goes up because below each of these equations there is another line with the description that you added so it's for you or for the for the person who is going to use this model after you explaining what was the idea with the equation below yeah and if you take a look at this equation for example this is the mass density equation dm on the left behind this column, we can see the symbol that, uh, of the variable, which is the dm. Then we see the name, and below we see the equation, so the mathematical function. Yeah. Just to mention, in Robotic Modeler, you don't have to uh, write equation, equations explicitly. So like in here, dm equals something. It can be uh, written implicitly, as we will see, and we can still, we can still, um, we can still solve, um, solve. Uh, uh, for whatever variable that you want, for uh, if the equation holds that variable, we can we can solve it. If the equation, if the model is well posed, so we will learn about that. Here is uh, if you want to, if you select again uh, this uh, one of the capacity systems uh, on the right side, you will see the equations that are inside, and on the left side, you will see available equations for that class, so for the system class. So it's easy to just select add, add or remove equations. And if you want to define new equations, you de press define new equations, new equation. And here you can just define, it's very easy to uh, how you define equations. So you just type, for example, A equals B plus time uh, two times C, and you get the result log below. If there is an error in your mathematical operations, you're missing mathematical operation, or you have two mathematical operations, one uh, side of the other, you will get this uh, monkey at in between signaling you that this is the error that you have to uh, that you have to um, check and uh, repair to to improve your equation your mathematical functions as if you don't do that you cannot uh, press okay it will not be uh, there uh, it will be grayed out so you cannot make the equations equation if it is not uh, correct 
So this is also very good because if you're typing code, you can always type whatever you want. And then you'll try to compile the code and then it will tell you called singular, uh, not something is bad. And then you have to go and search and find this bad equation. While here you get uh, to check each equation that you make immediately. And then you have great trust uh, in your uh, model that you are going to make it work because immediately you know that all equations are um, uh, do not have any syntax um, errors. Yeah. So again, we take out this low level modeling errors. Um, so now we come to the first principle of models building and mass balance generation in robotic models. So it becomes a bit more interesting. And we are coming to the main part of what I wanted to present today. So why building your own models? Um, again, Matthew uh, talked a bit about it, but I'm going to uh, give it a different angle. So many times library models are simply not uh, suitable for uh, each and every application. And especially if you want to make uh, dynamic high fidelity models, then most of the time you will not uh, be able to make high fidelity model using um, existing library models. Um, sometimes if you have, for example, if you're using our software, you can use some library unit, which you can adapt. Sometimes it's just hard to adapt and you just don't have, um, you're not close enough. So it's just easier to build um, a new model. Also for new applications, for new unit designs, for custom models, and also to use it in combination with existing models, because sometimes you, you actually need to make something, something new to reflect the reality. Yeah. So we are going to take a look at a very simple model. So it will be easy for us to do the, um, the analysis, degrees of freedom analysis in our heads, but I'm going to show you uh, how, to do degrees of, how to do the degrees of analysis uh, for the well-posed model. So how to make sure that our model is well-posed, which means we can solve it. It's well-posed a mathematical problem, yeah? And also when it comes to dynamic modeling, we're going to also determine how to do a well-posed initial value problem definition. And that is something that people have more problem with, but we are going to do uh, the degrees of freedom analysis for both of the case, cases using this simple uh, case that we can handle in our heads. And I'm also going to show you how software will help you to do this every time, which is also unique to this software. And you don't get uh, that kind of help in any equation-based, uh, uh, any other uh, coding equation-based uh, software as far as I know. So. Here we can see that we have a, a tank and we have a battery limit, uh, inlet connection, and we have outlet connection and again, a battery limit. Yeah. So here we have our system equations. This is something that we can write on the paper. So we, we drew this picture and we're writing these equations on the paper. Sometimes it's not bad to do that if you have smaller models and we can check them first before um, uh, using the model. But with our software, you'll see you can really get a lot of, you'll get a lot of help so you can do it immediately uh, with, with the software. So what we have here is component mass balance. So we have the change of mass of single component. So this is single component molar holdup over time equals to uh, species uh, mass flow in minus species mass flow out. So that is our differential equation for the mass balance. Then we have total mass holdup capital M equals the summation of all masses of all species involved. We have the buffer uh, cross-section area, which is just a circle um, uh, calculation, a uh, circle area. And we have a liquid level, liquid level calculation. So here you can see, we can calculate uh, the equation says ma total mass hold up equals to density times the air cross-section area times the liquid level. And because we we can use, uh, we can solve implicitly for any variable in the software. We can solve for uh, for uh, for um, for level from this equation, and we don't have to write uh, L equals M divided with rho and A. We just don't have to do that. And there is also practical uh, reason why multiplication is better. Uh, um, so it's always better to use multiplication form. It, it's something related to the solver because it's easier to do a uh, derivative of multiplication than derivative of division. It's just a um, uh, computational effort. So these are, these are our system equations. So when we say system, we consider that this vessel, yeah, because it is a capacity system. And inlet mass connection and outlet mass connection are connections, as we say. So for the mass connection equations, we have that inlet mass flow rate will be equal some alpha times Fm, 
and this alpha will be the valve position. So we are making a really simple model, which is uh, mass driven, not pressure driven. And we say this is the alpha, it is valve position time, the FM, which is user specified uh, mass flow. So we can say it's 100 kilos per second, 20 kilos per second, we can change that, yeah? Then we have another inlet component mass flow rate equation where we have to uh, calculate what is the mass flow rate for each component, yeah? So we say then whatever that uh, inlet mass flow rate is, the F in, the, the, the based on the uh, user defined FM and the valve position, then we multiply that by the uh, mass fraction of each component, if we have uh, multiple components, and we will get uh, what is the single component uh, mass flow rate. So that is for the inlet, inlet uh, connection, so F in. And then we have only one equation for the outlet, which is, again, a component uh, mass flow rate, uh, and that equals to some beta, which is some lump resistance factor, times square root of the level. Yeah, so it's, it's not first principle, this is just an example. So we have uh, square root of the level times some lant resistance, which can be uh, length of the pipe, bends, uh, maybe even if there is a valve. Well, we don't have a valve. Actually, we would put alpha again if we do. So there is no valve, but it can be all other line resistances. Yeah. So if we take a look and we observe, sorry, we observe our model, uh, we can determine that we have some parameters and some variables. But let's see. How we how we come to that uh, to that conclusion? So, if we start to build this model, we will start. So this is our picture on the left, and this is what we we would need to do in terms of topology that we talked about. Yeah. So we have the battery limit for the source. Then we have a mass connection coming to capacity system, which is our vessel because vessel can store mass and energy. And from here we also have mass connection, the outlet one, to our uh, outlet system uh, to our battery limit uh, for the outlet connection. Yeah, so we have a system one, three, uh, and two, and connections one and two. So this topology is uh, this is the first part when you have to model something to uh, to think about it and understand what is the topological decomposition that you need to make to uh, make this model. And for this uh, simple model, this is uh, what we would need. Yeah, so. Further, we go with uh, species topology, now that we covered the physical topology, and let's let's make this case really simple. So we will use only a single component, which will be water. So we will inject water here, and then water will propagate immediately to all other systems if there is mass connection, which means that water will propagate towards system 002. Yeah? That will be automatic. Then just to explain briefly about the the uh, briefly about this automatic um, uh, automatic uh, mass balance or heat balance uh, generation but in this case it's a, it's a, um, it's a mass balance as i already said if you connect any mass connection to any capacity system then the system will uh, will form this uh, will generate automatically uh, uh, mass balances these balances can be molar based or mass-based. In our case here, they are mass-based because we are defining mass, but that is something that you can uh, easily uh, change in your, um, how it's called, in your model. So if you have connected uh, mass connections and you say, for example, I want to use mass connections, then you have to use uh, molar, uh, sorry, you have to use a species uh, mass uh, component uh, flow, species uh, component uh, flow variable, which is FM, and has these open brackets, which represents that it is a vector. So for all the species, uh, because these is used to form your mass balance. So your change over the mass of a single uh, component uh, in that system. So we must use this equation uh, like this, this variable. These are predefined variables, FM. And that is why, if you go back, that is why here we use this FM of species and here FM of species, which in practical uh, sense will be FM with squared uh, brackets, a bit of uh, um, how it's called syntax, not important at this point, but just wanted to mention that this is something, uh, this is a part related to, uh, to a free, a flow shooters because we have to make this uh, automatic and this is the way to do it. So we're just going to use this for the mass component flow, yeah, for in and for out. If we have reactions in our system, then we have to use molar component flow, 
because our heat of formations for the thermodynamical database are based on moles, like everything in chemistry. But that is not a problem because if you need mass, it's easy to, to convert from moles to, uh, to mass, uh, knowing, the, knowing the molar mass of any, any species. One more syntax that I wanted to mention, so which is the second thing, is that we can, in our connections, uh, which we uh, tr uh, try to convey mass and energy, uh, we can use, if we have, for example, a pressure-driven connection, we will uh, have to know the origin pressure and the target pressure to calculate some flow. So again, this is not a first principle um, equation, but we can say that flow variable in this connection equals to Z, which can be a valve position times and then we have this or dot P, which means variable pressure will be seeked in the origin system, minus star dot P, which means variable P, which is pressure, will be seeked, uh, uh, the software will try to find it in the target system. And actually, it, these variables need to be calculated in the origin or and, var and target system or uh, set as parameters. So this is the second thing that you would need to, to learn in terms of syntax. To use, um, um, to use proficiently um, the connections because we always uh, uh, see what are the conditions in the origin system and what are in the target. And then we make a driving force. Like in this case, we have the pressure difference. It's a linear, uh, linear equation. It's not first principle, but it can be useful, useful sometimes. But it just, uh, just use it to show you that uh, we use this or dot and tar dot prefixes. And that signifies that pressure will be used here if you type R dot in the origin and here tar dot in the target. Yeah. So now back to our model. Yeah. This is um, our topology on the left, and on the right are the equations that we saw in the beginning that we want to add to our physical topology. So first to the inlet connection, we are going to add these two equations. And in the second equation, you can see this R dot xm. So this is the component mass, uh, mass flow rate equals to the total flow rate times the mass fraction, which we define in origin. So this R dot XM will signify that we will have to define this XM in this system 0001 in the origin. If we took out this R dot and just used XM, then this would be maybe a parameter in our inlet connection. But because we have this um, battery limit in the beginning, it feels natural that we define what is the composition of the of the uh, of the fluid that we have in the battery limit system. So using or dot will make software to seek for this variable in the origin system, which is this battery limit 0001. Okay, then we have uh, our um, equations that we add to our capacity systems, which is equation to calculate the uh, cross-sectional area of the of the cylinder. Uh, total mass holdup and one more equation that relates mass holdup, um, density, cross-sectional area, and level, which we will use to calculate level, but we will see that. As soon as we added these uh, uh, two mass connections, as I mentioned, we will generate this, uh, this equation here. So the change of mass over time of the, each um, uh, species component, we will have only water, so it's only one, but if we had more than this will represent uh, as much, you will have an, as much differential equations as uh, the number of the species. If you have five species, then we have to solve uh, the change of mass of each of those five species. So that will make five differential equations that will be solved for each of these species. So we say, uh, we see that the change of, of, um, of mass of a species over time equals to the inlet of that species minus the outlet of that species from the vessel. Yeah? And that will be generated automatically in the system zero, zero, Zero 03, so in this capacity system. And at the bottom, we have this, again, uh, uh, component mass flow rate, which equals to some beta, which is uh, some uh, lamp resistance, uh, line resistance through the, the, this line, the times the square root of, of the level. Yeah? So now if we, if we would add this and we would check our, our, our model, and this is something you're going to do, actually, this is one of the exercises in our introduction course. Um, this is how it would look like. So if we select this um, uh, inlet connection, we will see these two equations and we can see that we calculate F in and F M. So this is uh, total mass flow and the species uh, mass flow. Then we see in the, then we see in our system, we have a uh, form differential equations automatically. That's why we have this dotted line, which uh, separates the two. This is something that the software will uh, automatically 
generate. And we have the constitutive equations where we see that from this equation, we'll calculate A, the cross-sectional area. From this, we calculate total molar holdup M. And from this, as I said, it doesn't have to, it's implicit in that way. So we can calculate uh, um, L, even though the equation is not written implicitly, which is actually quite nice. And also, uh, one thing to, which is quite nice to mention, uh, the order of adding equations to your systems are not uh, important. It's not like in MATLAB that you have to have an order because it's not sequential. It will take this and solve it, so, solve them all at once. Yeah. And if we take a look at the bottom uh, at our outlet connection, we will see our Fm, uh, so the species uh, mass flow, uh, beta times square root of L. Hopefully you can see it. Here. It is on the bottom. So this is now a well post model because for each of these model objects, we get this um, feedback, uh, which you can see the green check mark. So we know that this is well posed, this is solvable, yeah? But sometimes, and this is easy because this is really small model, yeah? If we have larger models and we have a lot of equations, uh, we can actually get a help from the software to, to, to check, are we good? And if it's not good, how to get there, yeah? So now we're going to, this is this was really a simple model such that we can uh, think about it in our heads. We're going to check the degrees of freedom analysis for this model to see whether we made it uh, well posed or not, and also do the degrees of freedom analysis for our initial conditions uh, as well. So if we analyze this uh, this problem, so if we take uh, all of the equations that we have. So if you would have a code uh, type uh, of environment, you would type these equations like this. So they will not be topologically, topologically um, uh, distinctive, yeah? So if we take a look, we have 13 variables and we have seven equations. So that means that we need to define some extra inputs in, ter in terms of parameters. Some variables need to become parameters in order for our system to become solvable because system is well posed when it has the same number of variables and same number of equations. So we, we know that 13 minus seven is six. So we need six extra inputs uh, as parameters. And for our case, parameters will be the diameter of the vessel, which is, uh, which is understandable. The density of the fluid, let's say it's a really simple model. So the, the temperature doesn't change because we don't have entropy balance as well. So the density won't change of, of the water. Uh, then we have user specified inlet, total mass inlet. Then the valve position will be will be a parameter. The beta, which is a uh, lump resistance factor, and the uh, origin uh, mass fraction, which in our case it's only water, so this will be one. But we uh, uh, we be, so it will be a parameter. Yeah. So we will start from the beginning. Uh, before that, yeah, just to uh, yeah uh, give uh, why this is uh, why this uh, topology um, uh, actually helps us because. It again increases model transparency uh, by a lot because we can see a small number of equations per part. Uh, then you will see now in the following uh, minutes that the degrees of freedom is taken care of directly at specific parts. So we don't take all equations and try to solve degrees of freedom, but we take the small parts and we solve the degrees of freedom problem in each of these parts. Yeah. Then there is equation sorting routine, uh, which will help us, which uses uh, lower block triangular rule. Uh, to help us and sort the equations and immediately tell us if our system is solvable, uh, well posed or not. So we get that feedback and help immediately. Uh, so we make sure that everything is okay. And in the end, uh, this uh, uh, it actually it's a simple model. But if if would uh, if this would be a large model, then it would uh, actually feel as a, um, a composition of of many little models which we can handle with ease and not rather uh, deal with 30, 40 equations uh, to handle. So we will start with our uh, uh, battery limit source battery limit system. If you remember, we use this or dot XM in the equation. So if we select a battery uh, source battery limit system, uh, we will see that we have no equations in this in this level, but we have one parameter that is selectable. That's why it's um, called selectable box that we need to define. So we need zero equations. We have one one variable. It means that we need one extra input. So we define this as parameter, that would be that input, or we add equation which will calculate this uh, mass fraction. In our case, it's quite simple. So we just give this one extra input and we just select um, in the software, you just select uh, this variable and when you click on it, it will immediately move to the constants uh, and 
your system will be well posed because we have zero equations and zero uh, variables. We have one parameter, uh, so then it is it is uh, it is it is all all well. We continue further with the inlet mass connection. Here we have these two equations that we already reviewed. Yeah, so the total inlet equals to the position of the valve times the uh, user-defined mass inlet. And then we have component mass flow equals to the total inlet calculated based on the valve position times the um, what is the mass fraction, which in our case is one because it's only water. So we have two equations, but we have four variables. So then we conclude we need to have two extra inputs. And in this case, we conclude that we want alpha to be a parameter, which is valve position and user-defined uh, mass flow because we want to change this dynamically maybe so it is a parameter we do not calculate so now if we take a look at the equations here before we do anything now we just know we have uh, four variables and two equations so this system cannot be well posed because we do not have the same number of variables and equations and you will see these three asterisks in front of the equations signifying that we cannot calculate uh, any variable from here because we don't just have we have an uh, underspecified uh, system, yeah? So here then, because we know alpha and FM are parameters, we will just select alpha, and then we will select FM, inlet mass flow. And first alpha will move to the constants, and then as soon as M, uh, FM moves to the constants, also the F in and FM of the component mass flow will move to the computer the known uh, cones automatically. So software will do that and it will show you the green check mark sign because it will, uh, after every of your action, the software checks uh, whether the system is well posed now. So as soon as you get it well posed, it will tell you that it is well posed. So you get a lot of uh, uh, help for this model. It's again, a very small model, but if you have larger models then you get uh, this, uh, you can, you don't have to think in your head uh, what was what, but you just know these are parameters. And then once you assign the parameters, software will check automatically whether the rest of the supplied equations to the system are good enough, uh, enough uh, it's enough to define well-posed uh, system. So here in the computer, the knowns, we will see the variables that we calculate. And we also see the XM of the origin, it says origin, because we use it in the equation, but we are not specifying it here. As we said, we specify that in the origin uh, origin uh, battery limit. So it says you use it in this equation, but it is defined somewhere else. So I'm going to treat it as computed and no. So now we come to our buffer tank capacity system. And here we have six variables and four equations together with our um, mass balancer course. Yeah. So also, again, we have inlet uh, component mass flow rate and outlet. These are used in the equation, but they are defined in the connections, not in the connections to the system and out of the system. So we are not going to treat them. Uh, uh, we are not going to calculate, uh, calculate, uh, calculate them in this system. So we don't care about them at this point. Yeah. So again, here we have six variables, four equations. It means that we need two extra inputs. It's easy for us to decide. We have diameter of the vessel, that will be a parameter. And also in this case, the density of the water. So again, here we can see that we couldn't, we could we could have calculated the total mass holdup, but we cannot calculate everything else. So we select D as parameter diameter and we select row. As soon as we select row, system checks and sees how we have a well post system. It will automatically move uh, A, L and um, M and M would be there already, and you will have nothing left in the selectable box, which means you have a well-posed system. So you have no asterisks in front of your um, uh, equations uh, here, and you have nothing in the selectable box. That means your system is well-posed, and you get the feedback with the check mark that tells you that your system is well-posed. Now we go to the outlet mass connection. We have uh, two variables, one. Uh, one equation, again here, we know that beta is parameter because it is lumped um, resistance. And we select beta, beta moves to constants and uh, our uh, component mass flow moves to computed and knowns. Again, L origin will be there because we use origin dot L in our equation. And this is the level that is calculated in the, uh, in the capacity system in our uh, tank. So that is calculated there. So we treat it as known um, here. Yeah, and in the end, you can get what, what I uh, spoke about. You will get this green check mark. It just couldn't fit on this um, on this screen, 
to show you both uh, both um, steps but in reality you will see this every time so you are immediately um, sure that this will work yeah so this now this now made we went through all of the parts and now we know that we have well posed uh, systems so we did the degrees of freedom analysis of course this was easy because the model was uh, model was um, small but if the model was uh, large or large then software as you can see could help you and will help you uh, to always make sure to, that you have enough equations to describe what you need to describe and make well-posed um, systems. Yeah. So uh, we let's as the solar always tells you whether you have underspecified or overspecified system. We can see that. So normally you always start with underspecified systems. So you added equations, but you need some extra inputs like we uh, needed. So if we have only two equations here. We need uh, we need to uh, we have these asterisks in front and we have still something selectable in the selectable box. It means it is under determined or under specified system. So we need to uh, to assign uh, to add input and in this case we could have clicked on area to make it as parameter or add equation to calculate area from the diameter and then select the diameter as parameter like what we did. But the software will uh, always show you uh, what type of situation you have. So in this case this was under specified system. The other possibility is that you over specify system and this helps uh, and this um, uh, software will help you because this happens mostly when you have larger models and you add a lot of relations equations. Uh, so in this case, you will have axis in front of the equation that you added, but there is nothing in the selectable box, which means that probably some of uh, one uh, or two or three or more equations have the same variables inside of them just arranged in different uh, relation yeah so you over specify so then you have to take a look and see what is the equation that you should ignore because you over specified you made a model that cannot be solved because uh, you have two relations for the same thing yeah so in this case as we can see we had uh, the same equation so the first one m equals rho times a times l and then a equals m divided by rho divided by l so it's exactly the same relation just written differently and sometimes you can get carried, uh, especially if you are coding, and uh, and then you will miss this, and then it will take time to, to find this error. But uh, with this kind of help, it just you will just see, aha, uh -huh, I have asterisks in front of my equation. I have nothing to select. It means that you have over-determined or over-high index, so-called high index system, so it, it cannot work. So you, then are, uh, you can then check and take out the equations that you don't need. Yeah? So all together with equation physical topology and manual dynamic initialization, we are able to get consistent set of initial conditions every time. So regarding con initial conditions, this is hopefully, yeah, I think we will make it. We have enough time just. So for this uh, for this small model, we defined, we, we came to a conclusion that we have a well-posed uh, well um, model. So it is solvable. But because this is dynamic model, we need to provide the so-called uh, initial value, initial values um, to solve this, to start solving. So we need to know what are the values of all variables at time zero. Yeah. So here are all the variables that we need to know what are their value and time zero. So these are all the variables that we already met so far. And plus this one more variable, which is in the beginning, it's the 14 one, I think, which has this dot over it. And this will be the derivative because the derivative of a function and uh, uh, the derivative of, of the variable and the variable, they're not the same uh, thing, yeah? Because variable will have uh, its value, but derivative is the change of the variable over one step of integration, yeah? So we need to know also the value of this variable. So variables defined as parameters that we already know was uh, that uh, diameter, density, valve position, uh, user-defined uh, mass inlet, uh, user also defined uh, mass fraction, which was one because we have only water. And this was beta, which was the line resistance. So at zero and or for any other time, so one, two, three, we know their values. We can change them uh, dynamically if we want, but we know their values. We don't have to calculate them. So that would leave us with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight variables, eight unknown variables at time zero. What is their value at time zero? And if you take a look at our equations, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we immediately know we have eight variables and seven equations 
And that would mean in this term, uh, that would mean that we need one extra input to make uh, this system, uh, to make this uh, um, system uh, being able to initialize uh, or to make a well-posed initial value problem. Yeah? So let's go again. We will do again the same thing, but for the initial conditions, for the same, for the each uh, each point of each the topological part of our model. So we will start for the, we will skip the, the inlet uh, battery limit because we had no equations there. So then we don't have to look that. It's just XM as parameter. So we start with our inlet mass connection. We have these two equations and we have these two, these two variables. So it's the same, uh, it's the same uh, two, two equations, two variables. So we have, we need no extra inputs in terms of initial conditions for the inlet connections. And we could have known that already because we need initial conditions only where we have differential equations because there is where we calculate over time, yeah? If we don't have a time operator, then differential operator, then we don't need initial conditions. In these equations, uh, we, we do not have any uh, differential equations. So this is, um, uh, this is uh, ready to initialize once the systems which do have um, differential equations are initialized. So initialization of connections of mass and heat connections is mostly trivial. Once you initialize the systems, you just go and initialize, you exchange heat and mass between these uh, um, systems. So no extra input here. Then we come to our buffer time capacity system. And we have, as we said, one, two, three, four, five variables here that we need to know at time zero, but we have only four equations. So immediately we um, conclude that we need one more extra input. We will mention one more that we have this uh, mass um, component, uh, mass inlet and mass outlet, but we don't uh, treat them here because they are calculated in the connection. So they're not part of this analysis yeah? because we calculate one in the inlet connection and one in the outlet connection. Yeah? So that's why they're not in this, uh, they're not in this uh, line of, of variables. Yeah? So we know that already that we defined uh, that we defined uh, d uh, diameter and rho as parameters so we have four equations and five variables so we need one extra equation we can also see in this particular um, problem that we have equation a which we can call a static equation because it depends on the uh, diameter which is a parameter so we can change diameter and then the cross section area will change but the as soon as we have a uh, diameter, which we will have, we also have the initial value of A because it's just um, easy to calculate this, yeah? So in reality, we have one, two, three, four equations and one, two, uh, four uh, variables and one, two, three equations. So we have to choose now uh, to give initial conditions for one of these three. So uh, we can give initial condition to the mass, to the total mass holdup or to the level. So Normally, if you have uh, one differential equation, which is first order, you need one initial condition. Yeah. So as much as uh, differential equations of that order, you, that is how much in, uh, initial conditions you need. But sometimes, for example, this is easy because we can say we have 20 kilos and that is our initial mass. And then we are OK. We gave this extra equation that we needed, the, the, this extra input. But sometimes uh, for the temperature, for example, you will have the enthalpy balance and you will for sure not know what the enthalpy is. And then you can use the algebraic equation, your constitutive equations to assign uh, variables uh, which are related to your uh, enthalpy. For example, you assign the temperature value because that is something that you will know. And then you're able to calculate the enthalpy, um, the enthalpy uh, of the system. So in this case, we can choose to uh, set because this may be easier to set the level. So we say we have to add one extra input, which will be our initial condition that level is two meters. And once we added this, then we have the same number of equations and variables and this system, uh, and we can initialize uh, this system, yeah? If we continue further, we go to the last, uh, how it's called, the last equation, and we have the mass, uh, component mass outlet of, uh, of this uh, buffer tank. We can see that we have a uh, single variable and single equation. And again, we already know there is no differential uh, uh, variable there. So we don't need initial, uh, we don't need how it's called initial uh, condition because we will just uh, calculate uh, exchange heat and mass between the, the, the origin and the target system. So with this, we concluded our um, initial value problem 
uh, degrees of freedom analysis. And you can do this uh, basically on the paper if you want for any model of any complexity, yeah? But for the larger model models, this would be, become very tedious and a, very, a, a large amount of work to, to do this. So with the software helping you, you can easily determine uh, whether you have well-posed system and if you have well-posed initial value problem. And just to conclude, I think we have just enough time. So software also he uh, helps you with determining. So we knew now because we did our analysis by hand that we need one more, uh, one initial condition uh, because of our analysis. But sometimes it's a lot of equations and you can you will not do this, but you want to uh, check whether um, supplied uh, initial conditions are enough. And software will help you with this as well. So once you enter your parameters, you will do this if you do the intercourse. Uh, for the vessel as well, for the outlet connection. Then we go to the initialization of our uh, buffer tank. Yeah, this is our model that we are going to, that we talked about. Um, so we, one, once we check this I column that you can see here, this stands for the initial conditions. Once we make this uh, checkbox here, the, the X, that means that we are assigning this value as, um, as how it's called the uh, initial value. And now this may be okay, or not, we know that it is okay because we did, we just did the analysis, but if you have a larger model, you will not know, yeah? So there is a way that software can tell you whether this is a, a, a well-posed initial value problem or not. And that is to click on this button below, which, which says show in initial sorting. Okay. And if you do that, we're going to uh, uh, go over a few slides because we don't have time. We go to this slide and here we will see once we assign this, we will see the initial sorting, how the solver will try to solve this. And in the sorted equations, we can see that we can calculate mass uh, of each component. So it is solvable. And we can see that this M with uh, square brackets, component mass holdup is available in computed and knowns. And we have nothing in the selectable box. Again, the same principle. And that is how we know that we have well-posed initial value problem. If we had a larger system, uh, of equations and we would still we added some initial conditions that we thought are a good um, start and then still we have something in the selectable box that is a suggestion from the solver from the software sorry to uh, to assign one of these uh, as initial condition and check again so you go you think what is uh, what is what has the most meaning you have to think it's mathematical solver is uh, is stupid if you can say but you that's why you're there to think what variable should be initial condition then you would again add this X and then you would again go to uh, showing it sorting. And at, at the moment that you see that your selectable box is empty and that you can calculate your differential variables, which means that you don't have uh, asterisks here and you can see the differential variable in your computed unknown. That means that your uh, initial value problem is uh, well posed. And once you press this calculate initial values, you will calculate all the values of the of the all the values of your system, how the initialization procedure hello. works. Yeah. Sorry, hello, engineer Vladimir. Yeah. Uh, we are. Thank you so much. We we are running out of time. Trying to meet up with finishing on time. Uh, okay. Yeah. We still have one minute left. That's why. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> okay. It was a bit condensed, but uh, just wanted to uh, to show you how models are built. Okay. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to, to respond. Okay, that's great. All right, so let's have some questions and comments from uh, our team in um, business. Let's have questions and comments. Okay, um, yes. Can you hear me, please? Everyone, can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. So, yes, go ahead, please, Isaac. But I, I have no questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I thought it was. Okay, there's someone whose hand is up. Isaac, please, Isaac. All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, good evening. Yeah, I want to first of all appreciate um, SP Posako section for bringing us this um, webinar. And I also want to appreciate Dr. Matthew and um, Mr. Vlad Vladimir for the very expository um, 
webinar. I'm also a chemical, um, I do chemical engineering in undergraduate, so I could relate to a lot of what was said. And um, I have about three questions I want to ask quickly. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so first of all, um, yeah, Movatech um, is really offering and preferring like solutions that would help. I could imagine myself using Movatech software as when I was in undergraduate days, it would have been so um, enjoyable for me for the kind of projects that I undertook um, during my thesis. So I wanted to ask if there was a possibility of having access to the software um, after the initial 30 days of um, like the trial period of trial, what's uh, for education for educational use? Uh, that's quite okay. You just contact me and we'll arrange something. Okay, 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 okay. It's not because, our uh, uh, it's not our business case to uh, to take money <laughs> from students. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, because uh, what I was asking was that I I used um high oh, when oh, I was working. Vladimir, you're on, still sharing. Uh... Oh, I'm sharing my screen. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Just one. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So I I used high when I was um, working on my undergraduate project, and I had mm -hmm. a lot of issues because I didn't know a lot of things that were running under the hood of the. Uh, modeling software was just about inputs and outputs. It did a lot of trial and error, and it took so much time. I couldn't do certain um things I wanted to do because I I didn't have that access to some of the models, most of the models actually. Mm -hmm. So so that's why I asked, and then I wanted to find out if uh, Mobile Tech actually collaborates with like schools or and. Um, yeah, some High schools students. are are using uh, the software, but okay. uh, it depends. So uh, some people are doing modeling with it, but we also have uh, operator schools there. We make finished models, and they just use uh, the tool to learn how to operate certain uh, equipment. But then it's okay. the, you know then it's a different kind of use, and eh? that's the the thing I showed you in the first hour. Okay. Okay. And, um, but, but it's not something thing. like uh, like ISIS. It's quite different, and you will notice when you do it yourself that it's also it can be uh, quite uh, complex to set up your own models, and it takes yes. some effort to to learn how to do that. Yes, yes, I, I saw that a lot, and that was that's actually tending towards my last question. Uh, if there are like documentations, um, stroke like typical um tutorials. On the more yes. on mobile tech of like yeah, yeah. typical follow, plants. Uh, you you can follow the link that uh, Vladimir sent you, and that's our uh, introduction course. Okay. And, okay. and then you can, there are uh, five, right? Yeah, five tutorials uh, which will get you started. Yes. But then, if you want to learn more, uh, well, we have quite some more material. And uh, right. well, it depends All on right. which direction you want. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll be in touch and yeah, uh, no thank problem. you so much once again. Yeah, for the presentation. Okay, thank you so much, Isaac, for that question. Uh, we have we take one more question from Daniel Ibanga. Okay, and mm -hmm. he says, um, he says his question is centered on the differential equations. Okay, he said, does the software develop these differential equations, or will the user write out these differential equations? That was the first question. And he also said, um, secondly, does the online training cover how a user can understand deeply the well-posed systems for complex plants or systems with multiple equipment? So the question is in the chat box. So uh, yes, yes, yes. I see that. No, no the, the second one, the complex plants and multiple equipment, that's more for intermediate and advanced courses. Yeah. So that's not covered in the introduction. And uh, the software, yes, it develops the differential equations, but mainly the mass balances and uh, the component mass balances and the energy balances. But that's typically in 99% of the cases, these are the differential equations that you need. So these are generated indeed. 
just to add, if you want to add and uh, some other differential equation, you can do that as well to constitutive systems, to constitutive equations. So you can you can develop uh, certain um, differential equation and add it to a system and calculate uh, certain stuff. That's also possible. Okay, that's great. That's great. Um, I want to give. I want to thank uh, um, Vladimir for that session. All right. So yes. right about thank now. You, Thank you so much, Dr. Matthew. All right, we are going right to the next uh, part of this. Um, we're rounding up already, which is the membership drive um, session. Okay. All right, um, so I just want to be sure we can see. So the membership drive session. Okay. All right, um, team lead, please. I would like you to share, if you could share from your end. I think uh, there's a, a bit of an issue sharing from here. Okay. Can you hear me, please? Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hello, I can hear you. I yeah. am not joining. I think we're the only ones left here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can hear you loud and clear, but I can't see yes. on my end because I'm not joining with my computer. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Do you think it's the issue you have so you can share? Okay, I'll try and uh, join in again. You just add me up. I think that would sort it out. Okay, everyone, let's just be a little bit patient for some seconds. Let Joel join back. Okay. Okay, please confirm if you can see. Can you see my screen, please? Yes, yes, you can. Okay. Yes, you can see. Okay, great. Um, all right, so we'll take the membership drive uh, by Manala Agbo. All right, so... Um, I don't see Manuela on the call, please. Come again, you said? I don't see Emanuela on the call. So please, you can go ahead and take it. All right, so um, now the SPE is a place for all of today's oil and gas, energy and industry professionals and students, regardless of experience or course of study. So our members include um, students, recent graduates, young professionals, senior professionals. All right. Um, all right. So membership benefits include strong industry knowledge like you got today. All right. From mobile tech um, team. All right. Uh, live technical events, enhanced industry knowledge, networking events, um, conferences, 
volunteering and lots more, lots of uh, benefits being a member of the SB. So we call on you to join us today. The SB Port Harcourt section is the second largest in Nigeria, coverage of over six states and 12 state chapters with a membership strength of 1,206 professionals and over 3,000 students. So uh, look forward to you joining us. If you're on the call and you have not yet a member of SB, please do well to join us today. Thank you so much. So let's have the announcements right away without further ado. Um, from the let's start from what comes first. We have this from the, on the sixth of April. We're going to have another technical training, and it's on mastering decline curve analysis with Hydra. That will come from the Petrol Decision Company. Okay, that will be on the sixth of April. So um, keep your calendar marked on that and then from the 10 a.m to 2 p.m on the saturday the and then from the second to the fourth of may we're going to have our ip symposium um, and it's themed empowering today's energy leaders uh, navigating the digital from the oil and gas industry so please um stay tuned and keep um your eyes open on that all right so we're going to go straight to the closing remark by our industry, by YP industry collaboration team lead. So over to you, over to you. Okay, thank you so, 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 and um, we thought this number of people still stop in and learning and benefiting from the, the knowledge sharing from um, our school, Dr. Matthew and uh, Mr. Gladney. Thank you guys so much for creating time of a busy schedule you know, to share the much more better improving in the process um, space and, uh, you know, it's amazing. I, I believe everyone that has been in this call from um, 4 p.m. West African time to now have had one or two things to benefit. And um, yes, thank you for dropping your contact, seeing them, and really, if I don't stay in touch, we have email and LinkedIn. And they will always continue the conversation. Particularly, I want to thank Mobile for you know letting us know about the free. Um, the free course, the free training course, and going for that we will offering to give out um, 30 days free trial on the mobile sector. Okay. It's an amazing one, and I'm sure we're going to leverage on that to improve on the knowledge we've just gotten um, this evening. We can't thank you enough, and we uh, want to um, extend even more things from our section chair in the person of Mrs. Uh, Mbosley. You don't want to avoid it. You have sent to the book in here, but um, she's on avoid it. Yeah, okay. thank you so much. And we look forward to having this type of technical discussion and webinar in the future. Uh, we'll stay in touch and I will always get back to you when we need um, more of this knowledge. Here. Thank you so 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 much. And thank you guys for joining. For everyone that have been on the call for three hours now, honestly, it's not easy. I was able to tell that some people would fatigue, but here we are still asking questions and very passionate about the subject. It means we're really doing that to them and change the narrative you know, of our industry. Thank you so much. Keep being part of SP activities. If you're not yet a member of the Society for Human Engineers, I would encourage you to register because the benefits that highlighted by Joe are enormous and can never be on the site. Once again, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, um, Team Lead, on that. All right, so we are closing now. Um, closing now, so we just share um, a lot of prayer that we go. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you to our presenters, Dr. Matthew and Engineer Vladimir. We appreciate you so much. Um, I find the Robotech. Uh, software very interesting. Uh, it's, it's a good one. My first contact with it, and I must say it's a good one. So please let's um, let's have a closing prayer now. We go. There's so much quickly volunteer, and then we go for prayer.
Yeah, anyone please. Yeah, quickly. Okay. In Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we exalt you and thank you for the privilege to gather together and to also learn and be impacted. Lord, we ask that even this knowledge, Lord, that has even been transferred onto us, that we'll use it to better humanity and also make progress in our various careers in Jesus' name. I ask, Amen. Lord, that you will take each and every one down to the rest of the activities for the day and we'll all have all cuts to return all the glory unto you. Continually bless SP, Potter Cuts, and all who collaborated to make this a success. Thank you, Abba Father, for in Jesus' name I've prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Isaac, for that. So we call it a day today. Thank you all for coming. So let's continue the conversation. Share your thoughts on our social media platforms on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. Please do well to share your thoughts. Thank you so much. See you in the next one. Bye. All right, all right, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.